Welcome to this uh, presentation. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is a new theory of relativistic quantum mechanics. But um, the, um, the reason for this talk really is a set of questions which have come out of the um, uh, Nature of Particles group, which this, within the context of this theory, all of those can have an answer. So what I want to do is, first of all, present the theory, then um, deal with the questions. So I'll say what the questions are going to be, then I'll uh, pick up the questions one at a time as they come up. And at the end, I'll, I'll, I'll say what I think, um, how this theory can answer those questions and how one can understand all of those different aspects within the theory. So what you're seeing here is you're seeing um, a picture of the quantum bicycle motion. Now, this plot is a multidimensional plot. It's a plot of an isolated positron, a single positron. Uh, positron has been chosen rather than the electron because the positron has the field directed outward. The electric field is outward directed for the positron, which is easier to draw, no other reason. So the green spikes sticking up and around all the way on the outside are the electric field of a localized photon, which is trapped within a self-reproducing quantum system. The blue arrows pointing towards you out of the screen are the magnetic field associated with that electric field and that, that trapped photon where E cross B gives the pointing vector, which is denoted by the red-headed arrows. Now, so this is a diagram of a path in field. This, this is not a path in ordinary space. It's a path in field momentum space. And what do I mean by field momentum space? Well, I'll come onto that almost straight forward. I'll come onto that right now. These, the, the, this is a plot of three right-handed axes. And these are the axes which are used in the plot, in the previous plot. So green electric, blue magnetic, green cross blue, electric cross magnetic pointing vector red. And the, the little side things, side veins denote that this is a method of plotting a very large number of dimensions at once. We're gonna talk about a 16, not really dimensional, it's four dimensional, but those four dimensionals, those four dimensional systems are, are multiplied, but there are four squared linearly independent degrees of freedom in this system. So how do you plot 16? degree of freedom thing on a 2D plane. Well, for one thing, you can use perspective, you can use color, you can use form, you can use art. You can use perspective and shadow to raise yourself to 3D. You can use refractive forms can help to show what you're taking things around. This particular thing has fins. Now the fins mark the rotation of the arrow shaft. And if you look at the yellow fins and the cyan fins, they denote a plane, a planar object, a bivector object. So if you like, the green things could be taken to be a, a vector direction, actually they're also a bivector direction. Whereas the, um, the, the fins can take with respect to that a bivector direction. So going back to the original plot just here, you see that, that those things, there, there are multiple copies of that. But the other thing is this little yellow, I'll just drop out of presentation here so we get a pointer. This little yellow ball just here, that's the origin. And the origin is really where most of the action happens because this plot is in field momentum space. What do I mean by that? I mean that the electric field itself is a three-dimensional array of directions, three and not four, E, X, E, Y, Z. The electric field has always been and is in quantum physics three-dimensional. The magnetic field equally is another three dimensions, linear independent dimensions, giving six degrees of freedom to the electromagnetic field in all. So some people, I think Kramer's used to call this a six dimensional system, a, a six component system. But there's a three dimensionality, but the point is there's a three dimensionality of electric field, but there's also a three dimensional of dim dimensionality of magnetic field. Now, when you take the cross product of those two things, you have something which is momentum like anyway, and that's another three dimensions of, 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 uh, of possibility as well. So we've already got nine dimensions on the plot here. Now, the little yellow ball is, if you like, a tenth dimension. It's the center of momentum of the object. And in fact, we've drawn the thing here as though it's a path going around and around in this field momentum space. But of course, an isolated positron or electron has nothing to go round and round except itself. So its center of momentum remains fixed. And what you have to imagine is you have to imagine, take any one of those little yellow balls and then imagine the whole distribution flowing through that yellow ball. So it's really, not the train going around the track here, but it's the track going around the train that's happening in terms of what's happening in, in, in three-dimensional space-time, four-dimensional space-time. So that's kind of the model we're going to look at. This is this is the Williamson van der Mark model of the electron or positron. And we're going to be coming back to that time and time again. It's not the theory itself, that's the model that preceded it. So 
here are the questions that everybody set up. So these are the questions that we're going to answer. They're not the only questions that are going to get answered. There's going to be a, a, quite a few others come along as well. And in fact, at the end, I'm going to put up a series of questions that Martin and I posed in 1991. And that's a lot more questions than this. So at the end of it, there'll be a bunch of questions still to be answered, even though I think I can nail pretty much all of every single one of these. So the first one, why is the electric charge quantized? And there's no half electron or part of an electron. Well, first of all, I want to say there is a part of an electron. I know that because I've studied them. I've managed to put electrons into little bits and study parts of them. So there are half electrons, but electron charges are quantized and they come in whole units. Where does, so you, you, you can take an electron and split it up, and especially you can get its quantum mechanical mode structure and tease that out. And you can see those nodes, you can see them in the solid state where electrons are large. And I have done, J.G. Williamson and Al Fisro of B1990, there's a paper which is gonna get referred to on that. But nonetheless, electrons come as whole electrons and you get all of the bits of the electron at once. You don't get a bit of the, bit of the electron, you have to have it all, even if you stick in the quantum mechanical mode. So, Next thing is, where does the Coulomb interaction come from? Well, that's related to the electric charge, of course, and we'll talk, to, talk about that too. How does one prevent infinities? Because if you go to quantum electronics, this is sort of theory I cut my teeth on back in the CERN days in the 1980s, then you have a couple of infinities. You have infrared and ultraviolet divergences, and they give you problems when you're doing quantum field theory, which you can solve with renormalization, as Feynman showed many, many years ago. We have standard techniques for dealing with them. But it would be nice if we didn't have to have them at all. So can we get rid of them? And the answer is yes, of course we can. Then, then a, question four is a bit of a Swiss, a bit of a cheap question because it's really four questions. You know, what's spin? What's magnetic dipole? What's angular momentum? And what's the system of Bacon clock of the electron anyway? Well, we'll deal with all of those as well. And then the question, why do we have three leptons? Well, uh, that came up in the discussion that followed the uh, conference last week. And I think I've kind of answered that, again, but I'll answer it again, just, just for people who haven't seen it. And then what are neutrinos, baryons, mesons, and strangeness? Well, this is where I'm going to give a partial non-answer because I'm still a little bit unhappy as to what I think neutrinos may or may not be. But for the others, I'm going to go for it. Well, why is the proton lighter than the neutron and the neutron than n plus p? Well, the neutron's lighter than n plus p because it's a bound state. And if you have a bound state, it's always lighter. So that's that. But why is the proton lighter than the neutron? We'll deal with that. And what holds nuclei together against the Coulomb force? Well. The strong interaction is the standard model method, of course, but I'll talk about what I think the strong interaction is. How do we get gravity? The Newton force for particles. I'll talk briefly about that. But that's probably another talk as well. And also my colleague Viv Robinson is going to talk about that uh, when he gives his talk to the group as well. Uh, he has a different model of gravity, I should say to me. But why does the model behave quantum mechanically and not classically? I think this is a wrong question too. The systems behave both quantum mechanically and classically. So I'm gonna say why it behaves both quantum mechanically and classically, the model. And also I'll uh, say what I think a photon is. I'll say why it doesn't dissipate and I'll talk about its distribution in space and time. And uh, that always begs the question, who's space and who's time, of course, but that's part of the answer. But I'm gonna, and you'll notice that I've, I've labeled these questions in hex, a decimal, one, two, three, five, seven, eight, nine, A, B. That's because when I tried 10 and 11, the formatting didn't work so well. So I thought I'd just go to hex. But I've also thought of four more questions to do C, D, E, F. I'm going to talk about quantum collapse. This thing, you have things are quantized, but they're not quantized until you look at them. And then when you do look, we have this quantum, this mystery of quantum collapse. I'll talk about that. I'm going to talk about the, not just the magnetic moment, but the anomalous magnetic moment, G minus two. Now that particular thing has been responsible for knocking over most models that people have made of the electron as in anything. So uh, particularly nice to have been able to solve that one. I'm gonna talk about the relationship between electrodynamics, quantum electrodynamics and classical electrodynamics, Maxwell electrodynamics and, and quantum electrodynamics. How the two things fit seamlessly within the new theory, which pulls them together. So a subtitle for this talk is from the standard model to the standard to a standard theory. I think the fact I think we've been sitting on a standard model for crying out loud for so long is a crying shame. It needs to be fixed. We need to go to a proper theory. And I'm also going to talk about the nature of the exclusion principle. So that's the questions to be answered. So what am I talking about? What am I going to talk about? The model, which we saw on the first slide, 
the kind of motion here we call the quantum bicycle motion or quicycle motion for sort. Quantum bicycle, quicycle is a, is a portmanteau word made from quantum and bicycle, quicycle. The quicycle motion, what is it? It's rotations of rotations of rotations. What one has is in the photon, one has an object which is spinning, it's spinning perpendicular to its direction of motion. And for a, for, a, for a spin eigenstate of the photon, we're talking about plus or minus one helicity, and we're talking about a spin angular momentum of h bar, plus or minus h bar. What that thing looks like in space, it looks like an electric and magnetic field, which each trace a spiral through space, 90 degrees out of phase. So you have a rotation, which is the twist of a circularly polarized photon moving through space time. That's the first rotation. Now in this quantum bicycle rotation, motion, that twist, which would normally move into the screen, rotates around, goes completely around and comes back and rotates once again into the screen, out of the screen, across the screen, round and round in circles, describing as it does a torus. So inscribing in, in a torus, this is a rotation of a rotation and that's depicted by the uh, thing here. You have a rotation, this is th this rotation here, the, little uh, cone thing here is the, the photon rotation. That thing goes round and round, Z, uh, Z axis, and maps out all of the possible directions in a plane, spinning around an axis Z. But that's not the only rotation. Such an object would be toroidally symmetric, but we know from high energy physics experiments that the electron is spherically symmetric down to extremely short 10 to the minus 18 meter length scales. This motion here, this offset is lambda C over four pi, which is about 10 to the minus 13 meters. It's very large compared to the um, point-like interaction of a single isolated electron. And actually that's another of the mysteries that one has to deal with. One has to deal with why does the electron look like 10 to the minus 18 meters in energy physics experiments? Why is it 10 to the minus 13 meters or odd in terms of its Compton wavelength? Why is it down to any wavelength you like for its de Broglie wavelength? And how come the thing is so big in atoms, 10 to the minus 10 meters, in the solid state, in low dimensional semiconductors at low temperatures, the electron typical wavelength is about 20, 40 nanometers. Electrons are 40 nanometers in extent. In a piece of metal, the largest electron in the metal is twice the size of the piece of metal quantum mechanically. It fits a half wavelength into the piece of metal. So if I take this nice pen, the largest electron in this pen is twice the size of the pen. That's half wavelength here, then another half wavelength going back again. How does the electron do that? How can the electron be so ridiculously flexible in size and yet remain quantum mechanical? Well, quantum bicycle is the theory, to, is the uh, model which uh, describes this to a certain extent. So that's what the axes look like. What does the model look like? For those of you who haven't seen it before, it was one of the papers that I put up uh, as a preamble to this talk. This is what such a, a, what a single path, single path, that path is, if you like, if you just follow the blue stuff around here, you see it goes around a double loop before it gets back to the starting point. A double loop is a fermion, it goes around 720 degrees before it gets back to its starting point. That is a physical spinner. And the reason that it's quantum mechanical and classical is the motion of the thing as a whole is classical, but the thing embodies a Zitterbewegung motion that in the Zitterbewegung interpretation of quantum mechanics, see David Hesney's 1980 paper, seminal paper, is the quantum mechanical motion of the electron. This thing is both quantum mechanical in that it oscillates, it goes round and round in circles, it goes round and round in circles within circles within a circle. So it's, if you like, triply vibrating, vibrating x, y, z, and t at the same time, at the same we don't quite have the words for this. At the same fate, well, you know, at the same something, some word we haven't invented yet. Same coordinate. That's the quantum bicycle motion. What does it look like when it's applied to the torus? So this thing goes around the torus. So it's spinning around. Here's a torus. Here's a set of torus, set of nested tori, cutaway view of a set of nested tori. These are toroidal coordinates. So the distance from the eye of the torus to zero as a commensurate distance from the eye of the torus to infinity. So these things are all offset. They're all circles, but each circle is offset in such a way that these things go as one over R and these things go as R. 
So, so if R is 20, this is 1 20th is down here somewhere in the, some, some, somewhere in the, uh, in the uh, 1, 1 20th of the way from the, from, from the origin here, from this thing just here. So what does a path look like? What does a double looping path look like? Well, on, on the surface of the torus, here's a bit on the surface torus, comes up here, goes down here, goes down there and vanishes behind the torus. So this bit is underneath the torus. This bit is also underneath the torus. That whole section is on the other side of the torus. You've got to imagine it being transparent and it pops out just here and goes around again. There's one double looped path. And of course, for a mode structure, it has to be all the possible paths. So this path is an equal path. This is another path. Here's another path. The whole thing is like skin of a sausage twisting around a, 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 a toroidal sausage. And the sausage is all skins. It's multiple skins going into the eye of the torus. That's the, that's the electron photon model, Williamson van der Mark, 1997, Annals, Louis de Broglie, one of the, one of the articles I attached. Now you'll see down here, there's a little thing in green. It says one, two, three, four, DEF. What does that mean? That means this pertains to questions one, two, three, and four, and D and E and F. So going back to the questions, what have we answered here? Why is the electric charge quantized? Well, because such objects come in units. And the electric charge, if you, you can calculate the electric charge from this model, because you know what, how much of you put into it, you put one photon's worth into it, you know what its energy is, it's 511 keV. You can therefore work out what looked at from the outside. So if I sit it just outside this thing here and put a boundary around this, how much green stuff, how, how many of these green points poke out of it? So you just, just integrate that and you get to your utter astonishment if you put a box around it, you get almost exactly the electron charge. The electron charge arises from the fact that you have rectified the twist of a photon where the field points in all directions. So it's always pointing in a single direction, namely the radial direction. This is a photon rectifier. It's something that takes light, twists it round and round, and forces the electric field to always point outwards and hence constitute a charge, which one can calculate. Calculation of that charge, if you put the two loops right on top of one another, if I force this loop on top of that one, and I try and do my very best to do a spherical integral over this thing, then I get 0 0.91 times the electron charge. If I do anything to give the torus any finite size, that charge goes up. So at the extremal pass, it goes to about 20 times the electron charge. But the important thing here is that it is a charge and that it spans the electron charge. So in some sense, the fact that we have 1e and not 0.91e tells you how big the sausage is on average, what the distribution is of those things within the set of toroidal sausages. So one can calculate the charge. And I'm going to do that calculation later. So that's coming up. So um, in the starting slide, I mentioned at the bottom the quicyclists. In this Anderson Morrison, Arnie Ben, Mike Drollier, Martin van der Mark, now sadly deceased, Michael Mercury, Viv Robinson, and myself are quicyclists. But in any kind of endeavor of this sort, there are a lot of people who've, been, who've helped, both in acting as foils, helping with um, commenting on papers and so forth. And what I've done here is I've put them up in colors. Basically, the shorter wavelength you are here in the colors, the more you've contributed. So the purple ones are the quicyclists, and then it goes blue green, orange, and red. So in decreasing uh, amount of involvement with moving this whole thing forward. So you may see your own name here, for quite a few of you. Um, uh, some, some of the blue people here, Graham Williams is my father, um, stop this and look at it at your leisure later. I think I don't want to go through it. Thank you. So the, these are Stellingen. Um, there isn't a proper English word for this, so I've used the Dutch word for the, it's, it's kind of like how you set your stall up. These, these are the starting points of this talk. One thing, a very important thing, is there are two bases. There's a space-time basis, but equally there's an inverse space, inverse time basis. And these two sets of coordinate systems, both perfectly good sets of coordinate systems, one of which is the space in which you move, space-time, but the other is the space in which you exist, the inverse space, inverse time space, is the space in which you have inverse time is frequency, E is H nu. Energy is Planck's constant times frequency. There's a sense in which energy is frequency. This is the energy space. This is the, this is the space of content. And inverse space is momentum. Inverse space, inverse time is the form momentum. And form momentum is content. 
So you are of inverse space, inverse time, and living in space time. So other inverse space, inverse, inverse time elements, like your neighbor or the people listening to the talk, are at different places in space time and in their own inverse space, inverse time universe as well, which is which is which is which is their existence. So inverse time is the elementary energy, and inverse space is, in some sense, the elementary momentum. Note carefully that in this funny space, big is small and small is large. Big size is small energy, small size is large energy. And the key is that inversion, this inversion thing is the, inver is the key to invariance, also covariance. The whole thing about covariant spaces is they're really space inverse space. Think about it. So another saying is that there exists an infinity of proper unities. What is one? What's one, one meter, one foot, one inch, one millimeter, one rod, one, one cubit? They're different units, obviously, but you can have a photon, which is any of those wavelengths. And for that photon, its whole unity is the inverse of that size. The bigger the size, the smaller the energy. So for any given photon, its unit, its unity is its energy, its specific energy, its color. And there are an infinity of possible colors extending through the color spectrum down to the infrared, infrared, in, infrared and ultraviolet up to X-rays and gammas and right up to some things which are presumably the size of the universe. No limit. Now, relativity itself, it should not be a surprise from the previous point, actually arises from a proper understanding of this inversion. And I'm going to derive relativity as well in a way that's much more beautiful, I think, than the rulers and clocks that people usually use. It's one of the slides later. Now, what about dynamics? Dynamics and interaction actually arise from the real meaning of what we call division in reality. Now, everybody knows how to do division. You know how to divide 12 by three and get four in terms of numbers. But I'm not talking about that kind of division. I'm talking about di dividing one physical quantity by another. So I'm talking about, for example, dividing meters by seconds meters per second to get a velocity. Now, velocity is a quite a different thing to meters and it's quite a different thing to seconds. It's literally independent of both of them, dx by dt, dr by dt. But what does it mean to divide space by time or space by, or space by a perpendicular space for that matter? These are the kind of divisions that really construct the reality in which we think we live. So relativity encompasses three realms. In fact, the invariant realm of things which are invariant lengths, invariant mass energies, invariant masses. They ha you have the covariant, the variances you get with uh, special relativity and, um, and with field transformations, which are different to the special relativistic uh, vector transformations, of course. bi vector transformations are different to vector transformations, shouldn't be a surprise. But there's also orthovariance that things, if you, if you start squidging things like space-time, you squash it in one direction, maybe you expand it perpendicular to that. So you have something which is orthogonal to that, which is, varies with something being changed in a given direction. These, of course, exist in solid-state crystals, as is well known. So uh, do they also exist in space? Well, yeah, I think so. And also, the, the physical universe is, multi is not merely four-dimensional, not, not merely space and time, but is multiply three-dimensional and multiply one-dimensional. In the theory that's, in the mathematics of the theory, which is to follow, you will find that there are four three-dimensional spaces sitting on top of one another. Four three-dimensional spaces are space space, space you all know and love, but also the electric field space, which has only three components and not a fourth time thing tagged on as a four vector does. So that's a bi-vector space, with two sets of three, three, so the three dimensions of electric field and the three dimensions of magnetic field. This table, I'm going to thump the table. What's hitting when I hit the table is the three dimensionality of my fists on the three dimensionality of the electric table. It's electric field on electric field that stop my fists going through that. The reason the table looks three dimensional is because it is three dimensional. It's three electric dimensions. Okay, it's also got some metal bits, three magnetic dimensions. And also, it's got three spin dimensions, which are also stopping my fist going through the table, like exclusion principle stuff, stronger than the electric field stuff. But it's the electric field that I actually feel at the table, not the spin. 
So the physical universe is obviously multiply three-dimensional. Look at it. Do not mess around. Use your eyes. Think. Thinking has gone out of fashion. People stop thinking. Everybody thinks it's not 3D, it's really 4D. That's not true. It's not merely 4D. It's 4 3D plus 4 1D, 16D. Okay, so what is quantum reality? Well, remember, there are different kinds of reality. There's real reality, whatever it is. There's the second kind of reality, which is the reality we make up inside our own head. The second world of Popper. There's the third world of Popper, stuff like cups that don't exist till you invent them and then they're everywhere. Cheers. Of whatever kind of reality, whatever kind of reality turns you on. We need a new theory because we need to go beyond the just energy approach of the Hamiltonian and Lagrangian field theories. These are great. They've been wonderful for well, at least 100 years, but they're really just not making any progress at the moment. We need to get beyond them. We need any such theory to be both fully relativistic and properly quantized. And that doesn't happen for solutions in quantum mechanics at the moment. In the theory that we actually use for engineering in ordinary quantum mechanics, the things are certainly not relativistic. And when we do go to relativistic quantum mechanics, it turns out that we can do very little. We have trouble solving the hydrogen atom. You know, multiple atoms are kind of beyond us. So the quantization that arises in Dirac theory is really pretty hairy, as many of you may know, as a lot of you are trying to, trying to work on those. We need a better theory, that's the thing. Now, Maxwell always is, and it always was, fully relativistic, even as Einstein was being born, that was relativistic. And actually, his development there was really based on proper thinking about how light transforms, as I will demonstrate later. Now, Maxwell, on the other hand, while relativistic, is not complete and ignores quantum spin and flow, amongst other things, many other things. It's also vastly under-constrained. Lots of things are solutions to Maxwell's equations which are not physical. So, however, part of the reason for the lack of progress is that Maxwell developed his theory in quaternions in Hamilton's quaternion algebra. Now, unfortunately, while in his textbook, if you look at any given chapter, I think chapter five is about 15 pages long, and then there's a half a page done in quaternions, which is much more dense, and which does the whole chapter five in half a page instead of 15 pages, 30 times the rate. However, the approach was dropped in favor of heaviside type nonsense, vector algebras, because it was the quaternion stuff was thought to be too hard for students. And so after the students had been taught some, not taught something, of course, they couldn't then teach their students and their students. And we are the students of the students of the students of those students. And that's as old guys. So generations have been teaching our students to not be able to think properly, except for one or two very notable exceptions, some of whom are listening to this talk. So uh, thinking about you, Peter, there. Is... So we have a Beautiful relativistic theory and Dirac theory is beautiful. It's one of my theories, but it's 90 years old, ladies and gentlemen. It introduces spin, but it doesn't really do very much for charge. And it introduces spin in too obscure a way to properly think with it. It needs improving. So, the, as I said, the result is that Schrodinger is H psi is E psi is used almost exclusively and not Dirac Hamiltonian formulation of Schrodinger is the most useful one for solid state physics and atomic physics. So Dirac, Maxwell, and Schrodinger theories are all good. They're all wonderful. And any theory we invent must reduce them in the proper limits. They're good, but we have to do better. We need a proper theory in proper, in the relativistic sense, new mathematics to enable, amongst other things, proper spin thinking, quantum spin thinking. So we want to develop a mathematics which is based on experimental reality. Mathematics is going to follow the physics, not the other way around. So in this mathematics, matter and light have the same underlying nature. One can describe within this new mathematics, both light particles, photons, and material particles, electrons, protons, neutrons, etc. How do we do that? We introduce a new term into electromagnetism. This new term will not be charge, it's not spin, but together with the fields which are already in electromagnetism, it gives rise to both of these, together with the fields. These new solutions are electromagnetic vorto vortex solutions, electro mass magnetic, I should put in there, electromagnetic vortex solutions in momentum space. So the momentum space does do the mass field, momentum space brings in the mass. 
Now, the new theory reduces precisely to Schrodinger quantum mechanics. It underpins quantum electrodynamics. It reduces to ordinary quantum mechanics. It reduces to Maxwell, and it encompasses relativity, Newton, et cetera, in proper limits. That's the theory which we're going to do. So, but before I do that, I want to have a little rant about mathematics. The proper progress of science has stalled, mired in mathematics. The problem with mathematics is mathematics can do wonderful things for you. It can allow you to think things you otherwise couldn't think at all. But if you set up a maths with a bunch of axioms, you're stuck in those axioms. You're in an axiomatic space which you cannot get out of. So a merely mathematical theory may not progress knowledge at all. Worse, it may impede it, especially if it's immune from experiment. And there's a whole bunch of so-called theorists who very cleverly design mathematics in such a way that it doesn't have any possible experimental test. And they claim to do such things as string theories and uh, quantum chromodynamics and many worlds theories. This, this is stuff which in any other century would have been looked at as kind of witchcraft. These things are completely made up. They don't have any relation to the real world because they can't be tested by the real world. Now, that wouldn't be so bad if it didn't take some of the brightest and the best. This is a waste of lives and talent and it has to stop. And that's partly what bicycle is about. Bicycle is about not doing that kind of nonsense. Maths is a very potent language. It can allow one to think the otherwise unthinkable. It's software for the brain, it's a great thing. It can enlighten you, but it can also make you blind. If a natural symmetry or quantization is introduced as an axiom, then one obviously has absolutely no hope ever of saying anything about it because it's one of the bases of the theory. And if you look at the standard model, there are over 50 of these bases including charge, including quantum spin, including color, including everything that's interesting in other words. Now that is just not good enough. We have to, any theory we come up with would better reproduce a lot of the standard model because the standard model is mostly good, but we need to move from standard model to standard theory. I don't understand the question of quantizing everything a priori because any quantum number you come up with is an expression of what you don't know, not what you do know. You just put it in, there's no hope of just getting of, of claiming to get it out, although people do. There's an awful lot of that about as well. And the, the main takeaway from this is mathematics must be subject to reality and not the other way around. So, so in the new theory, dynamical objects are not really in space and time, but are more of space and time. So the the, the Everything's related to the base space, which is space and time is the basis space. That gives rise through inversion, through the, to inverse space and inverse time. But also, there are then products of these uh, spaces with inverse spaces. So, for example, dx by dt, velocity in the x direction, is a little bit of space divided by a little bit of time. So I could multiply one over time into space, or I could do space times one over time. Either way, in fact, what I choose to do is do one over time into space, changes the sign. This is a non-commutative algebra. So we have actually done a study of which possible sets of orderings give rise to science as it stands at the moment. And there are, there are but few. I think we're down to about four possibilities at the moment out of a very large multiplicity of possibilities. This is work carried out between myself and one of my ex-students, Ennis Anderson Morrison, over many years. But um, we think the one that we're showing is at least consistent with physics as it stands, although we're open, open to persuasion that um, there are problems at the corners. Um, the dynamical objects here are, what, what do I mean by them being not in space and time, but off space and time? I mean, velocity is d space by d time. So it's made of a little bit of space divided by a little bit of time. And if you want to talk about field, you can say field arises from a vector potential. It's dA by d, dA by dt is the electric field, um, and, and, and curl of A is the magnetic field. These are things that are not in space and time, but are off space and time in terms of the mathematical structure of ordinary theory, not just this theory. So what, what do these spaces look like and how are they related? Well, let, let's do an example of inverting a space. So I've got a two-dimensional space drawn on the left-hand side of this screen bunch of circles, uh, polar coordinates, if you like. Now, 
if I want to invert that space, now it's, the space isn't drawn with uniform spacing, it's drawn with uh, a spacing that's related to a unit circle, which is picked out a slightly darker color, I think. It's about here. So what the spaces are is there are spaces inside and one over our space is going to the middle. So there is many divisions going down to zero as there are going out to infinity. What I'm going to do with that is I'm going to take each one of these lines. So if I have a point just here, here's my reference point. The point just here, its inverse point is going to be in the same direction. Let's say this is two here and this is one. The inverse for that is going to be one half. It's going to be here. So likewise, if I take point at three at um, point three just here, its inverse is going to be out here at three. So if I take these, so if I now get the computer to plot that, what does it get? It plots circles to bicircles. So the inverse of a circular distribution is a bicircular dis distribution. So there's one of these circles goes around the things which are inside the unit circle. The other one goes around things that are outside the unit circle. So as you as you as you move along this thing, you go click 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 click. You go to this, and then you go through um, the unit circle, which is this line just here, and then and this goes up to infinity. So that's the conformal inverse. So if you look in old textbooks of people when people used to use these kind of things for calculations in Maxwell's time or at the beginning of the 20th century, you'll find illustrations. My favorite one is, is, is Field Theory for Engineers by Moon and Spencer. That has this, this uh, plot as well, though not quite in exactly the same way. So uh, the inverse of circles is, a, is, is two sets of circles. This is a, look at this, what have we got here? That's a chop through a sphere, isn't it? And that's a chop through a torus. The inverse of a spherical or a four spherical object is a toroidal object. And projections of hyperspheres are either tori or spheres. Four dimensional spheres are either three dimensional spheres or three dimensional tori when you project out dimension. Now, inverse times frequency. Inverse space is momentum. But how does that metric come into this? The metric comes in by having a look at the difference between, if you like, it's the difference between one over one, between real. If you take the metric, the metric plus, minus, 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 what you have really, if you think about it, is these things that square to minus one, they're like imaginary dimensions. And in that sense, we're not living in the real world. We're living in the imaginary world. We're living in X, Y, and Z, taking the Dirac metric, plus, minus, 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 means that the world we live in is actually an imaginary world in the sense of complex numbers, or in the sense of hyper-complex numbers, anyway, three-dimensional uh, Clifford, Clifford uh, algebra CL13, which is the one I'm going to use. These are the things that square to minus one. So in that sense, we live in we live we live in imaginary space and real time. Time is real, space is imaginary in the sense that real and imaginary happen in complex numbers. Now, as I've said before, the differential dynamics leads to four derived three spaces and one and four derived one spaces, 16 spaces in all. What I want to do is I want to, for those of you who are not familiar with the Clifford algebra CL13 or with Dirac algebra, but the Clifford algebra CL13 is isomorphic to the Dirac, to one of the two Dirac gamma, the mostly used, the most used gamma matrix algebra. I know there's more than one, um, but it's isomorphic to the gamma matrix algebra, which is used in high energy physics. And it's often called the Clifford Dirac algebra for that reason. Now, the Clifford Dirac algebra has these 16 different degrees of freedom. And let me just go through them. I've got the pointer here. Alpha zero, this is a unit time vector. Zero denoting time, I denoting space, X, Y, Z. I runs from, Ro Roman numerals run from one to three, Greek run from zero to four, zero to three. So this alpha I is alpha one, alpha two, and alpha three, X, Y, Z, R, theta, phi, whatever you like, any conformal orthonormal system will do. One temporal dimension, three spatial dimensions. Now these are the, these may be taken as being basis dimensions. You can also take the tri-vector set as being the base dimensions and generate the whole thing. But simplest is bestest, let's just take the vector set. Now, if I multiply any, 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 any one of these things by itself, alpha zero times alpha zero is plus unit scalar. This is the unit scalar, alpha P. P for point, P for pivot, P for ponderous mass. 
this is going to be the dimension in which mass exists. It's the dimension in which um, it is that element which provides confinement of the photon in the electron photon theory to be presented. Hence pivot, it's the thing about which it turns. P for point, it's a point not as in terms of a mathematical point, a mathematical point I define as something which is as close as you like to not there at all. So not there at all, really. No, this is a point as opposed to a line or a plane or a volume or a four volume. So it's alpha P for point as opposed to a line. This is a line, X, Y, Z, T, unit, 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 unit vector in time, unit vector in X, unit vector in Y, unit vector in Z, unit vector in R, unit vector in theta, unit vector in phi, the toroidal coordinates, unit vector in rho, unit, unit vector in zeta, and unit vector in phi. Whatever, any conformal orthonormal well-behaved coordinate system will do. Have different kinds of solutions, of course, and that's part of the nice thing about switching, switching things. However, what happens if I multiply two things which are different? So if I do alpha i times, if I do a unit vector in x times a unit vector in y, alpha one times alpha two, well, I get alpha one, two. I get a bivector. Now, I get a space, space, bivector, two spatial directions, bivector. So there's alpha one, two, alpha two, three, and alpha three, one. There are three of them. Of course, there are three dimensions here. So there are three permutations of two. However, if I take time, there are also three permutations of that, alpha zero, one, alpha zero, two, and alpha zero, three. Three dimensions. Now, this is the three dimensions of space, and that's one of the three dimensions I mentioned. This is the three dimensions of magnetic field, and that's what magnetic field does for you. Magnetic field, letting one of those things loose on a vector will rotate it through 90 degrees. It's a quaternion. These are quaternions. They are isomorphic with alpha p, alpha p and alpha ij. That set is isomorphic to the quaternions. This set, alpha p, the pivot with its dual, is isomorphic to complex numbers. This is a very nice algebra. This is a beautiful algebra. This is the algebra of reality, I hope. I don't know, because it's one of four possibilities, but it's certainly a very nice possibility. And if it is the nice possibility, that I hope it is, then it's also a solution to Hilbert's sixth problem in terms of putting this through a proper theory. And that is also a claim that I'm making here for the first time. I'm claiming this as a solution of Hilbert's sixth, the whole theory, not just this algebra. Why? To get mathematicians thinking about it and telling them, no, no, Dr. Williamson, no, don't worry, sorry, you've got this wrong. You've got the handedness of this basic element wrong. It should have been left-handed and not right-handed. And I will welcome such a person with open arms and say, thank you, my friend, for doing all that hard work, for which I was totally incapable. So I'm going to claim it as Hilbert sticks and then see, where, see what comes up. Stir up the hornet's nest and see if I get stung. So there we go. Anyway, so here's the three of space. Here's the three of space space. Here's the three of space time. But there's another three. The other three is the thing that have one component missing, alpha zero ij. So that's missing the K, it's 0, 1, 2, 0, 2, 3, 0, 3, 1. These are elements of quantum spin. Because a paradigm for this is if you have a momentum, momentum is, momentum is um, MV. So M is a scalar and V is a bivector. V is, so it's M dx by dt. So it's M, 1, 2. It's in the alpha 1, 2 direction. So if you have a momentum and it's going around something, so it has a d by d y. This is the z-axis. It has some d by d y. Adding some d by d y to that gives me an alpha zero one two. It's the kind of direction. It's the direction of angular momentum. This is the direction of space. This is the direction of magnetic field. This is the direction of electric field. And this is the direction of angular momentum. They are four different three-dimensional spaces. This means that they don't necessarily have to all line up with one another. We're dealing with a multiplicity of four three-dimensional spaces here, four of them. And they don't all have to have the same origin either. And in fact, they don't have the same origin because if we go back to the quantum bicycle thing, the first thing you see about it is that the spin of the photon is around a different axis to the spin of the thing as a whole. 
they're offset by a lambda c over four pi by an amount, which is one of the things that lead to the fact there are no infinities. So here's another three dimensional system. So I've given names to these. You can, call, you can either call them by their indices, pvot, pivot, uh, this came point, point, vot, zero vot or, or t vot, time, t no, 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 not t vot, because these are something else, zero vot, and, and three vot, if you like, there are three components here. They, those are vector vot, v vot. Uh, these, are, these are field vot, f vot, but they can be split into b vot and e vot, and uh, angular momentum here, uh, t vot. Um, and then you've got okay. This stuff. This is this is a single unit. This is this is this is this to angular momentum is as time is to space. This is usually taken, and I think this is a big mistake that people keep making. Keep thinking that angular momentum can be a four vector. How can angular momentum be a vector? Think about it. Angular momentum being a vector is a major rude word up. It's a major stupidity. And yet people insist on making angular momentum into a four vector. Nonsense. It's not, it's a tri-vector. And it hasn't, yeah. I mean, the other thing is that people think that electric field is a vector. Electric field isn't a vector, it's a bivector. It always was. And it is, it's no more a vector than that magnetic fields are vector. Okay, people say, yes, well, it's a component of an antisymmetric tensor. Well, the tensor algebra is too damn simple as well. So th these are all, Cases where humans have invented an algebra which has messed up their minds and limited their thinking. So fine, if you want to have your thinking limited, use a tensor algebra or a vector. Yeah, or the vector product. Yeah, right. This is what we teach our students. No wonder they can't do stuff. Now, there is a fourth single element. And that element is the four-dimensional hedgehog. Um, which Innes <laughs> came up with the lovely name of the Quedgehog. This is, so a, the idea of a hedgehog is it's three-dimensional directed volume. It's either outward directed, spines outward, or a more uncomfortable hedgehog inward directed with all the spines facing inwards. So, so the electron is uh, in the direction of the uh, negative hedgehog and the positron is in the direction of the positive hedgehog. Well, the Quedgehog is something with all its spines facing outward or inwards as a directed hypervolume, including time. So forwards or backwards in time, if you like. Perhaps it only has one value, huh? Anyway, yes. So there are 17 linear independent unit elements. The 17 is the amount of stuff that you stuck into each one of these things. So um, all four 3D spaces. Now, I said the 3D spaces were all different, and they are. But they have one property in common. If you hit them with a quaternion, they all rotate in the same way. So if I have an object, and that object has some, some existence in three-dimensional space, and it exists with fields and with electric and magnetic fields and spins and everything, at least if I rotate it, the mathematics rotates all the bits in the same direction and not, doesn't rotate the liquid out of this bottle into, into, into my face. It doesn't rotate different bits in different directions. So in the sense that everything does the same thing under rotations, you can say that the electric field in, in Z is parallel to the magnetic field in Z. Now, look, the magnetic field in Z is not, the magnetic field in Z exists entirely in the XY plane. It's people, people will say in, uh, in, in a more advanced electromagnetic book, that this, is a, that this is an axial vector. And people get the magnetic field as an axial vector, but we are taught in our undergraduate elementary classes that the electric field is a vector and that is wrong. That is misinformation. Look up Wikipedia, it's wrong too. Wikipedia is often wrong, so it's not too big a shock. Anyway, so that's the 16 components and the three and the four three spaces and the four single elements. But there's more goes into the theory than that. The other thing is there's a sharpening of the principle of relativity. What do I mean by that? We're going to take relativity absolutely seriously to the extent that I call it absolute relativity, no element may appear without its proper form. You can't have an X without an alpha one. You can't have a Y without an alpha two. You can't have a T without an alpha zero. You can't have a magnetic field without an alpha one IJ. It may not appear, and it may not appear in the mathematics, not only in prefactors, but also in, in exponents, also within 
within, uh, within arguments. Now that's a new thing, but it is actually doable with these things because they act like, well, they act like a, they are an algebra. You, well, you can invent the algebra that works in that way. And that algebra is the Clifford Dirac algebra. So one can insert relativity properly, fully, by using the Clifford Dirac algebra. And it's the only way to do it really properly. You force the mathematics to parallel nature as closely as possible. Then you use that to describe nature. That develops a mathematical reality to attack Hilbert's sixth problem. Hilbert's sixth problem is the problem of, of axiomatizing the whole of, the whole of nature in mathematics. It's one of Hilbert's five or so unsolved problems. For those of you who don't know about Hilbert's problems, he proposed about 30 or so, I think 33 outstanding problems in mathematics in 1903, of which most have now been solved. There are five or so still remaining. This is one of them. So what are the consequences of absolute relativity? Well, the first consequence is the four vector differential is modified. Second thing is that when you do that, when you let the four vector differential loose on the sixth field, normally in, in tensor algebra, you only get two of the four Maxwell's equations. And to get the other two, you need to take the dual, as is well known to any sort of page 500 or so of Jackson. There are actually two ways to do it. You can either, you can either use a field and a dual field, or you can um, make a tensor up with the completely anti-symmetric um, tensor, and you can use that. And then you can write in a slightly nicer looking way, although it's still the same cheat. But this algebra gives all four Maxwell's equations in a single step with all the right signs, as will become very clear when I do exactly that. So that's a big bonus of using this method just by itself, but it's not the only bonus. The fact that it does Maxwell's nicely is not its main property. It also means that any propagating solutions have far more constraints than Maxwell's equations. They're very strongly constrained. They're constrained to have constant angular momentum for one thing. So momentum quantization, so angular momentum quantization is a thing in the theory. Energy, frequency, and wave number are all linearly related. Energy and frequency and wave number are all linearly related. Forcing commutation gives black body quantization. So we get the kinds of quantization just by forcing a commutation relation. And we have new solutions, and these solutions are quantum relativistic photon solutions. So these are the consequences of what happens. I haven't done the theory yet, but this is what it's going to do. So let's start doing the theory. So what is the theory? Well, here in the box is an expression of the theory for a single isolated part particle. I've written it as d mu, that's d by dx, that's alpha zero d by dx, minus alpha one d, sorry, alpha zero d by dt, minus alpha 1 d by dx, minus alpha 2 d by dy, minus alpha 3 d by dz. It's a four derivative, but with the proper unit elements as absolute relativity demands in it. And that acts on the 16 components of the vector I already defined. So we have a four vector of a 16 object, and every one of, and there are therefore 16 products, there are 16 separate zeros. Each one is individually zero. That is the theory of the motion of the quantum fluid, the Williamson theory of the quantum fluid for an isolated particle, photon or an electron. Written in the Mathematics of Absolute Relativity, Mart. Now, what I want to show in this slide is I want to show how this mathematics, this CL13, this Clifford Dirac algebra, has beautiful interlocked multidimensional patterns in it. Along the top line here, we have 16 different elements, uh, starting with the pivot, then going four vector, time. So running along the top, so yellow is uh, pivot, uh, then comes time x, y, z, then comes bx, by, bz, then ex, ey, ez, then uh, spin x, spin y, spin z, then the hedgehog, then the quetchhog. That's running along the top, and that's running along the side as well. Same thing. And then the products of those, clearly the pivot times the pivot, anything times itself is gives everything contracts to the pivot. So down the diagonal, you have yellows all the way. 
Now, um, that's not quite true. In fact, it isn't true at all for the uh, quadrant vector. Th that has something on the diagonal for the, uh, for, for the time component. But then if you look in the boxes, you see the dark orange boxes have uh, similar kinds of diagonals to the diagonals that you see for the uh, pivot, for the scalar. So they kind of act like scalars within each box. However, what are the boxes? Well, what the boxes are is the box, the first box, top left-hand side, are quaternions. Uh, the light orange is the, is, is the scalar, and uh, the, um, the, the bluish things are um, IJK, labeling quaternions one IJK, where I squared equals J squared equals K squared equals IJK equals minus one is the quaternion algebra. So the quaternions are in the top left box, and that's the direction of the magnetic field. And then the next boxes, these are the vectors, and these are the quantum spins, sorry, magnetic field, electric field, quantum spin, and the vectors. And of course, these repeat because for any one of those lines, that every single element appears. It exhausts all elements in any line or column, any row or column. So that's the structure. And the structure has quaternions. These are not quaternions, but they're very closely related to quaternions. They're quaternions times one of the other unit elements. So they differ from quaternions in that they're multiplied by another unit element. So that's isomorphic to quaternions. All the stuff on di diagonal here are isomorphic to quaternions. This pair, the two oranges, the pivot and the quetchhog, are isomorphic by themselves to complex numbers. <clears throat> okay, that's the maths, Mart. Now comes the nasty maths. So I'm just gonna show the nasty maths for reference. This is a 16 derivative of the 16 components as calculated by Innes's, uh, Innes's uh, program for the conventions which we're going to use here, which is, I'll mention some of them, left-handed basis, they are divide into not divide by. So it's one over T times X, not X times one over T. That changes the sign of a lot of those elements. Same sorts of things still cancel, but it's it does change the it doesn't change the physics yet because the physics is unchangeable. It changes whether or not that is an acceptable thing to do in the mathematics. So some of these things contradict elements of the of the way that we describe physics, and others don't. And guess what? This is the one. This is one of the ones that does. As far as we know, we don't know because some of the things here. So what are the things here? Let's take the first line. We've got DPP. What that is, is that's DP by DP, I suppose. Um, the next thing is Nabla B. Nabla B is a three-dimensional set of bivector derivatives. So it's D by D um, one, two, plus D by D two, three, plus D by D three, one. So that's not a normal Nabla. The next thing is D zero T. That's a DT by DT. Next thing is Nabla T by T. They're trivector derivatives, Nabla T, D by D 0, 1, 2, D by D 0, 2, 3, D by D 0, 2, 3. D 1, 2, 3 is the hedgehog derived into uh, that. Div dot A is the normal divergence of A, and, and so on and so forth. And, and, and Nabla E is, 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 is the field like bivector derivative. So the things, so let's take a different line. Let's get one with curl E's. Where are we? Yes, so for example, the alpha zero JK one down here, if you look at this, you'll find the curl E term. You'll also find DB by DT somewhere. There it is. And all the other terms being zero, that's the Maxwell equation buried in there deeply. So if I just take the four vector derivative of the field alone, then all these terms will fall away except for DB by DT and curl of E. So these things are just really an extended Maxwell equation. But that's the full equation, which we're not going to consider because what we're going to look at is we're going to look at the much, much simpler equation, which is what you do when you get improve on Dirac quantum mechanics. So what am I going to look at actually in this talk is I'm going to look at not the 16 derivative, but just the four vector derivative, which is very similar to the four vector derivative in Dirac. But it's not the same. I'm going to say exactly how it differs. You see, normally when we do the four vector derivative in Dirac, we take I d slash. And what this d slash thing is, is it's a, it's a scalar derivative. It's, a, it's made into a scalar by taking d by dx and multiplying it by gamma one. 
And by, because gamma one is a four vector and d by dx is a four vector, you take one co and the other contra, so you have a co-contra pair. And that means that anything that that object acts on, even though it's multiplied by i, will be in the same space. So that thing acting on a spinner will yield something in a spinner space. That space acting on a spastic hamburger will lead something in a spastic hamburger space because that is a scalar derivative. Now, the reason people do that is because it simplifies stuff a lot. That is not a reason to do things. That's a reason to restrict your mathematics unnecessarily and mean that you cannot look at solutions that are proper solutions that are outside of the scalar derivatives remit. And yet that's what's, it's not what's always done. There are many people who do better than that. And I've seen people do much better than that, Peter. You're one of them. Beautiful. Um, but that's what's usually done. Look, if we look at this equation, this is Dirac equation standard form. I d slash minus n acting on a spinner is equal to zero. So that's in Wikipedia, for example. It's not in Dirac's. You won't find it in Dirac's fourth edition. If you want something better, you want to go to this. Uh, actually, you want Dirac's third edition, which is actually better than the fourth. So if you've got that on your... If you've got that on your, uh, on, 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 if you have that on your shelf and you're not looking at it, please send it to me because I can use it. So the third edition has got bits that the fourth edition doesn't have. Um, anyway, that's the Dirac equation. The Williamson van der Mark version of a relativistic quantum mechanics has something which is very similar to D slash, but without being a scalar. What it is instead is it is an absolute relativistic derivative. What that does, it puts the gamma matrix into the derivative and it leaves the other gamma matrix on the psi, on the wave function. So the two things can give you a Lorentz scalar and part of the solutions of this are just the solutions of that. But this contains that, except for the fact that this is also complex and there is no unit imaginary in this algebra. So this is both bigger and smaller the Dirac equation is both bigger and smaller than the Williamson van der Mark equation. Now, but look at these two equations. The Dirac equation is famously, and I have always thought it utterly beautiful and utterly amazing what Dirac did to get it. And he was and is one of my greatest heroes. And thus it was extremely painful to discover a couple of mistakes that he made here and there. And uh, myself and Peter, and uh, I think um, a chap I just which is at Krakow as well, have discovered independently different little bits and pieces where Dirac might have gone not quite in the best possible path at the time, although Joe is a good one. And I think the three of us, Peter, we need to get together still. We've had this going for a long time and compare notes on which bits don't work. But uh, anyway, this is my bit that doesn't work. This complex number here should not be here. And the D, sl and, and the D slash should not be a Lorentz scalar. If you do this, you get a lot of the same solutions. In fact, you get much nicer solutions. You get physical spinners instead of mathematical spinners, much nicer things. But also this psi is a 16 component thing which contains the physical electromagnetic field E, the physical electromagnetic field B, the physical electromagnetic field then, which contains proper vectors, the vector potential contains it, which contains the quantum spin explicitly in physical characters, in physical magnitudes, and not in some abstract mathematical bloody spiner. It's far, far more powerful than the Dirac equation, as you will see shortly. The complex imaginary is a two-dimensional thing which you've stuck on top of a four-dimensional algebra. What's that about, Mr. Dirac? Why have you got two algebras in here which are just completely Separate algebras. I know why, it's because quantum mechanics was written with a square root of minus one, you didn't know what else to do. But as soon as you write a solution, as was pointed out by de Broglie right at the beginning, with a complex imaginary in it, it's not relativistic. And the kind of solutions people try to find are things like A, E to the I, K, X minus omega T are woefully inadequate to describe anything relativistic because they always have to be fixed to some frame X and T or R and T, and that always messes up. You don't get relativistic solutions, though you have a relativistic equation for the Dirac equation, and that's why it's a spastic hamburger. The mass, further, the mass in Dirac is ad hoc. You know the electron has a mass. It's not here, 
So what are you going to do? Well, they're right. Like, okay, let's stick it in. But that's not nice. Here, the mass appears as a complex pair, as, as the pivot and as the quedge hog. It appears in the dynamics, not as a, this is just a lump of mass. Pick a lump of mass into, into something which is light speed. That's light speed, that bit. The Zitterbewegung is light speed. The eigenvalues of solutions to the Rack equation are plus or minus C, as is well known. But what do you do with the mass? Well, it's just sort of sitting there going mass, massing along. The mass of the rack is ad hoc. The psi here is a spinner space. The field is brought in through the vector potential as an extra add-on in Lagrangian field theory. And you can't do better than Lagrangian field theory. With Lagrangian field theory is great, of course. We've all played with it. But it's still just energy. It's, well, it's not just energy, because EA is a change of phase on vector potential, which has nothing to do with energy. So you are bringing in things other than the energy, but you're bringing it in only as a rate of change in a single phase. And this is not good enough. And the main problem with the Dirac theory is that it isn't real. And also, the other problem that Dirac had is he used the unit imaginary in more than one way. So he set things to the unit imaginary that really should be a, a vector, um, like x, and he said other things that should really be a tri-vector, like angular momentum in the x direction. And then he made them equal because he was using the same symbol. Oops. What this led to is it led to this. Hold on a second, I'll find it. I've got the rack here. There, can everybody see that? Top line there. This is the equation that Dirac came up with. It's got five terms in it. Now, what does Dirac say about this? This equation differs from equation 30 through having two extra terms in the operator. These extra terms involve some new physical effects. So far, so good. But since they are not real, as in their imaginary, they do not lend themselves very directly to physical interpretation. This is Dirac saying, I haven't got a clue what to do with these. So what does he do? goes on, to get an understanding of the physical features involved in the difference between 34 and 30, it is better to work with the Heisenberg picture, this picture being always the more suitable one for comparisons between classical and quantum mechanics. The Heisenberg equation of motion determined by another Hamiltonian, which gives you this part, it gives you the spin dotted into the Hamiltonian, but it doesn't have the spin dotted into the electric field part. That just vanishes. He throws that away. Now, if you look at other quantum mechanics, and, but he says he's throwing, it's Dirac. He says he's throwing it away. Now, the textbook, which I will not mention the authors because I don't want to be rude, which I learned relativistic quantum mechanics from, didn't even say that anything was missing. It just gave the Heisenberg picture as though one could calculate it from there. Now, one couldn't calculate it from there because doing it properly, there is an extra term there, which he had to throw away because it was imaginary. He didn't know what to do with it. That's really pretty much the same thing as my students pretending that numbers aren't imaginary when they have to do a division in first year. Now, isn't it? So this is not something, this is something where he should have gone back and had a better look at what he was doing at the basis of the theory. But OK, that's 90 years ago and Dirac made a huge, huge, huge bit of progress, of course, when he did this. So, I think the new equation is better. Why is it better? First of all, it precisely parallels all four free space Maxwell's equations. It contains those within it. Secondly, it treats the maths properly, the mass properly. Thirdly, it treats the maths properly. Fourthly, fourthly, it puts the mass in as a dynamical thing. It has, and fifthly, it has better solutions. It has solutions which are physical spinners, as well as which are photons, which are photon wave functions that transform correctly, um, covariantly. So, but the main thing about the new theory is that it opens up a complete new mental vista. The complete men new mental vista means that you have unprecedented power of thinking into problems, thinking into the problems that we're trying to answer just here, amongst other things, thinking into engineering problems. This is a theory one can engineer things with. So we, Quicycle Group is now developing engineering solutions to all kinds of things. These things include new energy sources, they include perfect conductors as opposed to superconductors, they include new kinds of chemical 
compounds, which I hope Arnie will talk about at some stage, give a talk on what we're doing with that. We can do, you, one can think things that otherwise couldn't be thought about at all. We have a new way of thinking. Mathematics is a language, and a language enables you to think things otherwise couldn't be thought and can't be thought in another language. We all know that. We all play with maths. We all know how to do this kind of thing. This one's a good one. This one's one you can really think with, and you can think about things that otherwise are completely untouchable. It opens up huge new engineering possibilities. And I think this kind of thinking is going to lead to lots of new materials, new devices, and new technologies. And what I'm going to do, after having spoken for just over an hour, is to stop there for a little while for a comfort break for everybody. Thank you very much for your attention so far. Okay, so that's that's the base theory. Now, I've put down here in green, one, two, three, four, seven, eight, nine, B, C, D, E, F. That is... I'm claiming that this theory can do all of those things, but um, let, let, me, let me develop the theory further. That's the first thing to do. So let's actually develop the theory and uh, write down what the theory is properly. So I'm going to do d mu psi g is equal to zero. So what, what's d mu? Well, what d mu is, is it's this, this derivative here. d mu is d by the alpha mu dx mu mu, dx mu, sorry. So if I write that out in full, one over alpha mu is going to give me alpha zero minus alpha 1, minus alpha 2, minus alpha 3. And d by dx mu I can write as just d mu, for short. And so that thing can be written as alpha 0. This is the same as this, written out in full. Alpha 0, d 0, minus alpha 1, d 1, minus alpha 2, d 2, minus alpha 3, d 3. This is an absolute relativistic derivative. So that's a, and it's a Dirac Clifford four vector derivative. So what's psi g? Psi g is psi p, the pivot, the scalar part, plus psi mu, the four vector part, plus psi mu nu, the field part, the six component bivector part, plus psi nu mu, mu, mu nu rho, the um, spin part, plus psi zero, one to three, the quedge hog. So written out in full, that is 16 components. And I can write those as little psi p, alpha p, plus little psi zero, alpha zero, so these, these little psi things are just numerical values, real number constants. So here's the 16 components, alpha p, alpha 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, 2, 3, 3, 1, 1, 2, 0, 2, 3, 0, 3, 1, 0, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, and alpha 0, 1, 2, 3. That's it. So what I want to do is I want to take the four derivative, I want to act with this on this. So I'm going to have four components acting on 16, and I'm going to get 64 elements. So, also, I just want to note the sub subset d mu psi mu nu, we're just taking the six field components, precisely parallels all four free space Maxwell's equations with the proper signs, as in the sign convention for Jackson. So, the new theory is an equation of motion for a quantum fluid encompassing Maxwell, given, giving, uh, encompassing new spin current constraint equations, resolving relativistic quantum mechanics onto physical quantities rather than mathematical quantities and I claim it underpins quantum electronics. Now let's try and show all of that. Here it is. Here's the four derivative of the 16 field. All the components, all 64 here. And once again, this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 7, 8, 9, B, C, D, E, F. I'm going to explain how this, I'll, I'll go into details later as to how these things will work. So here they all are. But if you look at these things, you see that for example, the first line here, alpha zero, is the time component after the derivative. Now, that means it's an integral scalar, partly, but also, so the time derivative of a scalar gives me an alpha zero, but also the one derivative of a psi zero one gives me a scalar element as well. And looking at these things, psi zero one is the electric field in X, electric field in electric field in Y, electric field in Z. Those three components are just the divergence of the electric field. So I can write them as the divergence of the electric field. And those <coughs> these are negative. That's the sign convection of Jackson. So, um, so it is left-handed, and he uses right-handed uh, system. So, uh, so these signs are all correct. But the d zero alpha p that's d zero of the pivot. So similarly, if you look at other things down here, you'll find that alpha zero jk. Let's have a look. 
you find elements that look like d1e0 2 minus d2e0 1. That's a curl element. So these six elements here are curl elements. They're the curl of the electric field. Curl of the electric field. 0 jk. Curl of the electric field. Time derivative of b. Without the p's and q's, these first four equ equations are exactly the four Maxwell's equations with the proper signs. What about the other four equations? We've got four new equations. We've got not four coupled first order differential equations, but we've got eight coupled first order differential equations. That seems like an awfully big bonus to get all at once, but it isn't really quite that big because if you look at the first of these, that's just the Lorentz gauge collision. That fifth equation is an equation which we call a gauge equation, which we use to constrain the far too many solutions of Maxwell's equations, and which we now call a gauge theory of electromagnetism. Except here, one has not one gauge, but four gauges, if you call these gauges. And these are gauge equations, including an equation here, which relates the curl of A to the time rate of change of the spin and also a gradient of the spin. Yeah. Maxwell's equations, which are equations of field and mass, mass field equations. If the mass is zero for the photon, one just has Maxwell's equations, as one would expect. One also has couple equations coupling the vector potential to the spin. These are new gauge equations, vector potential to the spin. So these are the Williamson van der Mark equations written here in full form, in full four dimensional form, and then here in a translation using the conventional divergence and curl, the curl of, because these are just the patterns of divergence and curl. So all I've done here is I've written these things with exactly the same prefactor, alpha zero, divergence of E, divergence of E, D zero P, D zero P. I've just transcribed those things using the sign conventions of, of Maxwell of, uh, of, of uh, Jackson. And so this is just the translation to um, standard form, but also incorporating now new things like the curl of the curl of the spin. This is a spin vector, T arrow is a spin vector, spin X, spin Y, spin Z. And they are related to the time rate of change of the vector potential. This shows where the aronoff bohm effect comes from, for example, but it doesn't only do that. These are extra constraint equations on solutions. Solutions become far more constrained than they are in the mere Maxwell's equations. So this is the central, if you like, slide of the talk. This is the new theory. So what are those 16 gauges? Well, one has 16 gauges on the right-hand side. Um, four of those, so, each one of those, so what, what I've done here is I've set those things equal to zero just here, but in fact, this is an array of 16 constants. If I set that to a set of 16 constants, if I set that to, instead of to zero, to a set of possible constants, what are those constants? Those constants are such things as a fixed spin. Now that might be a good idea, don't you think? One should be able to go into these equations and say, what happens if I fix the spin at h bar? What happens if I fix the spin at a half h bar? At the moment, we don't have a mechanism for doing that. We can say that, oh yes, one has to as well quantize it because everything is quantized in units of h bar. But one's just saying that. One doesn't have a reason for it. One doesn't have a mechanism for imposing it. Now I'm going to go do the reason for h bar quite shortly, but then one could go back to this and one would say, okay, well, the spin has to be in a particular direction. It's in the z direction. So I'll set c z for the spin to h bar. And I have another constraint equation, another gauge equation to constrain the solutions of the theory I'm looking into. Of course, one can also just say, yeah, everything's zero, that we're in free space. You have a photon, you have no interactions, you have nothing else there. Maxwell's equations, that's what you get. If you just add the charge and the mass, then what you get is you get confinement. And that is something I'll talk about when I talk about the electron. We're not on the electron yet, we're still dealing with a photon. So what is this new theory? Well, in the new theory, everything 
is of space and time. These objects are space-time objects. They're space-time concatenated, space divided by time, for example, velocity. Space divided by time times space. So that's an angular momentum, that's the spin. For example, these are just different. All of these things are they're combinations of 16, the 16 possibilities you can get with four elements. So what's everything made of in the new theory? What's waving and what's it waving in? Well, we need to understand this at a level which is more fundamental than the elementary particles themselves. So we're not going to say we have a photon and it waves, or guess what? Electrons, we've discovered waves, so we'll describe them with a wave equation which is what one does at the moment. One imposes this as a condition. Why? Because that's what one observes. We need to understand this at a level which is more fundamental than just sticking it in. What we have is we have root energy density, folding and unfolding, rotating and evolving in space and time. Now, why do I say it's root energy density? If you look down here at the bottom of the slide, which is going to appear at some stage, uh, on the bottom right, you see psi star psi and E is energy. Uh, electric field is defined as root E times D, uh, where this is the electric field and the electric displacement, and B is defined as the average root B H. So I'm just talking about electric and magnetic field as being, uh, as being something which contains the square root of epsilon rather than epsilon. And in fact, if you think about electric field, the energy in the electric field is given by a half epsilon e, uh, e squared. So ED is epsilon, epsilon E, D is epsilon E. So, and the root and the energy density is given by a half epsilon E squared. It's the energy density is a squared field intensity. So as the field doubles, the energy density is multiplied by four. Electric field in terms of energy is a square root energy density. So is magnetic field. Magnetic field in SI units is a half epsilon C squared B squared. Or C, or, or C squared B H properly. Same thing in quantum mechanics. The wave function psi is really a sort of square root energy density. You need to do psi star psi to get the energy density. We're talking about square root energy densities. And it's root energy density, which is the fundamental thing here. Electric field, magnetic field, the pivot, and the quechog are a pair. Again, one needs to have both to get the energy density. We're going to do P squared plus Q squared plus E squared plus B squared. That gives you all of the energy. Equally, A squared plus T squared will give you all the energy. But... One mustn't take both because one will be double counting because these are related by linear equations. So what's one what's electric field in one half cycle in one quarter cycle is going to be is going to be what, what's even in one quarter cycle will be odd in the next. So the even elements are mass and field, and the odd elements are spin and current. So spin transforms to current, trans uh, sorry, spin transforms to field, field transforms to current, current can. There's a flow of these things. The differential equations are splitting the energy each time between different elements of the 16 element algebra. And eventually, after four differentials, you'll come back to where you started from. And actually, a condition on particles, on stable particles, is probably more like after every, for every single differentiation that you end up with exactly the same thing. So whatever's coming into a box, Whatever's leaving a box is also equally coming into a box from another box or from another source. So there's flow of root energy amongst all of these different, different elements, driven by the dynamics and evolving in space and time, or rather inverse space and inverse time frequency locked to the um, phase of the transformation. So there's an evolution between fundamental elementary unit space-time forms, 16 of them, each one has some root energy, that root energy is floating around, going from one box to another in such a way that the boxes remain the same. Everything changes and yet everything remains the same. So in this evolution, you can think of lines folding out to give planes. You can think about planes coming out and giving volumes. The volumes could be dividing down to be a plane, then to lines, and eventually to a fundamental scalar point form, pivot. 
flow inwards and outwards through all of these different forms in the, as driven by the equations of motion from these different forms. So now we, we do this already. If, you, if, if, you, if you're looking at electromagnetic modeling of, of light in uh, waveguides, then this is exactly the kind of thing that you do to, to find out what the next quarter wavelength of light is going to do. Okay, here it's a little bit more complicated. There are 16 of these things instead of just six, but in principle, it's the same kind of thing. In fact, there aren't 60 instead of six, there are eight instead of six, because you have all the information by looking at either the odd set or the even set. The odd set has eight elements, the even set has eight elements. Eight elements of the even set are the fields and the masses. The eight elements of the odd set are the currents and the spins. Either or gives you the whole system because they fold one into the other and you know the evolution between them. So we're going to identify pivot, that's root mass, vivot, root charge and current, f vot for the field, t vot for the spin, and q vot is the root imaginary mass. Let's keep going here. Express mathematically, p vot and q vot act just like quantum mechanics. So that's why we've got the psi star psi here. And field root energy, f vot, is like, acts like the electric, electromagnetic field, half epsilon e squared, half epsilon b squared. Now, this vot, whatever it is, what is vot? of any form must be squared and integrated over to give over over the volume in which it exists to yield an energy. And the root mass terms here act a little bit like the Schrodinger wave function does in ordinary quantum mechanics. So we have a generalization of electromagnetism and we have an extension of relativistic quantum mechanics. What is waving what it's wave what's it waving in? Well We've actually introduced only five kinds of stuff. We've got three dimensions of space, one of time. Okay, we've got their inverses as well, but one can derive those. So I suppose we've introduced division, the concept of division. So maybe six, a uh, concept and five degrees of freedom. Having done that, we've taken this simple thing, this what, this, this square root energy density, and we've spread it over 16 different linear independent elements in space and time root energy density over 16 elements. So this is a new theory of the dynamics of this root energy in space and time. That's what this relativistic quantum mechanics is. That's also what the old relativistic quantum mechanics was, and also what the Schrodinger quantum mechanics was, and also what the Maxwell stuff was. It was always about root energy in space and time, always spatial and temporal derivatives in all of these theories of stuff that is effectively root energy in space and time. So we could, give a, a dimension of root joules to electric field, to magnetic field, to mass, to spin, to charge. One can do that with appropriate multiplications. Now, what these equations of motion are doing, in my view, is they're strictly limiting allowed operations to things that are actually observed, to the fields, the currents, the spins and so forth, the masses, using absolute relativity. Space and time are the absolute basis for x, y, z, t plus pivot plus x, y, z, sorry, x, y, z, t plus what, plus the stuff, that this root energy stuff, five degrees of freedom, and not a whole zoo of particles. These, this is the stuff of which all particles are made of, and photons, and everything, and you and me, in the theory, maybe in reality. One has to be quite careful, though. When you blithely multiply things, or divide things, in a non-commutative algebra, and this is also not a division algebra, there are areas where division is not, defined, for example, on the light cone, and it actually in any relativistic algebra is never going to be a division algebra because division is never defined on the light cone. Division is defined here for all of the elements I use because I use single element divisions, and actually nature also seems to use that, and, and this seems to describe nature well. But you need to strictly control what you can add what you can multiply, how that addition and multiplication is defined, the maths you make up has to parallel nature. It can't disagree a little bit here and there and then 
be made to agree somewhere else, as is often the case in many of the theories that we see coming past our noses. It has to parallel nature precisely, just and no more. And the tests of this theory are manifold, and they are that they have to precisely parallel nature. Otherwise, it isn't a solution to Hilbert's sixth, is it? So, and if it isn't, I just have to try harder. So please try and knock it over, that will be fun. One needs to keep it as simple as possible. So I talked about the flows. So let me just drop out of this, into this, so I can see the title here. So if we just have a first derivative, these are the allowed flows. So here are the different kinds of things. Here we have the scalar, here we have the vector, on this diagonal axis here, this is time, and here's x, y, z. Here's the electric field, here's the magnetic field. Here's the spin source, and here's the spin, and here's the quadrivector, dual mass. So there's different kind of flows that exist. Uh, it's, it's just one kind of differentiation, but we call them different sorts of things. So, so these are the curl relationships. C curl of the curl of the vector potential is the magnetic field. Curl of the electric field is the is the um, is the uh, spin. So these are curl relationships. These are uh, d by dt's, the arrows, the um, arrowheads. The arrows themselves are divergence or grad. So if we if we're dealing with photons, then what's happening with the photons is that one has a field, electromagnetic field, with a condition that d of that field is zero. Does that mean the vector and the tri vector is zero? No, it doesn't. It means that for every positive term in that derivative, there is an equal and opposite negative term. So, so while the um, derivative is zero, it doesn't mean the vector potential and the uh, quantum spin is zero as well. In fact, we know that it can be zero because if you take a photon, if you take a right circularly polarized photon, then the integral is going to give you h bar. Left circularly polarized, it's going to give you minus h bar. But if you take a, a linear one, it's going to give you precisely nothing at all. So, um, but it doesn't mean that the spins are everywhere zero, it just means that they average to zero. So these are the first derivative flows. And uh, this is courtesy of both Michael Mercury, who uh, decided, uh, I, I drew a diagram and he decided it was better done like this, and he's right. And Arnie Ben, who actually drew the diagram, so thanks to both of them. Now, I'm going to just derive relativity from the Doppler shift of photons. So imagine you have a photon which is sitting in a box. So, and it's bouncing backwards and forwards in the box. If you now look at that box when it's moving, what's going to happen is, so imagine we have green photons bouncing backwards and forwards inside my phone here. Then if I look at that phone moving, then the photons moving in one direction will be red shifted, and then the other direction will be blue shifted. In fact, let's move it fast enough that the green photons appear as they're coming towards you to be blue, and as they're moving away from you to be red. How has that mass energy, how has the energy in each of those things varied? Well, the way it's varied is if you start out with a unit um, eigen uh, energy, that's the green photon, these photons are truly green within the box. They are green photons in a green box, perfectly reflecting green box, which is perfectly green. So green photons bounce backwards and forwards and any other color of photons doesn't because they are they can get out so it's not got green so it's got green reflectors no matter how fast you move that box those green photons will remain confined in the green box but to an outside observer they will appear blue in one direction red in the other direction by how much well if you work it out you'll find that um if the um if the redshift of the photons is r then the blue shift of the other photons going in the other direction is, to your utter astonishment, one over r. And if you do the maths on that, and you work out what this r is from the Doppler shift, from the relativistic Doppler shift, you do the field transformations, and you find out to your utter astonishment that the gamma factor is a half of r plus one over r. Of course, what's happening to these photons as they shift the red shifted photons can only red shift down to zero as you move faster and faster. But the blue shifted ones can blue shift up to infinity. So the sum of the pair of those two things is bigger than the sum of two greens. You know, blue plus red is bigger than two greens. By how much? By gamma is by how much. The gamma factor is just 
exactly the difference in the energy gain on blue shifting of one over R compared to the energy loss on blue shifting of R. Half of R plus one over R is gamma. And beta is R squared minus one over R squared plus one, it's just V over C. So the conclusion is that the reason for relativity is just given that everything is made of light, that everything is made of light. And because light behaves in that way, and because matter is really sort of self-confined light, then everything can't behaves in that way and you can't go faster than the speed of light with a material particle because its nature is that it is actually a confined light-like particle. In, now this is for an isolated particle or an isolated green box traveling through space innocently. What about interactions? If you have an interaction between two objects, if you have photon exchange photon absorption, an electrodynamic process then. At light speed, what does the Lorentz contraction do for the photon? Where does the photon think the emitter and the absorber are? Well, at light speed, all the Lorentz contraction reduces the entire universe to absolutely no distance at all. So as far as the photon is concerned, the emitter and absorption are, and absorber are at the same point in space-time, but it is local doesn't matter how far away it is, it remains local. According to the exchange photon, the emission absorption always occur at the same point in space-time, provided that exchange photon is on Nash shell, which is a big proviso, by the way. So the photon energy is its inverse time scale. E is h nu, is h bar omega. And the in, this inner scale of light is its eigenunity. Now, those of you who are German speakers or speak German know that eigenunity just means own unity. Eigen just means own. Its own eigenvector is its own vector. Eigenvalue is its own value. Eigenunity is its own unity. Any photon has, as far as it's concerned, all the energy in the universe. Because the energy in the universe is what it is. That's it. Only bookended by its interacting emitter and absorber. Photons don't really exist independently of an emitter and absorber, of course. There's no such thing as an isolated photon. It has to be emitted and absorbed. But because they're emitted and absorbed at the same point in space-time, they do not interfere with one another because nothing else can touch them. Now, the present moment, the pinnacle and cutting edge of time to you, may be seen as the sum total of all possible interactions that you have, all intermediated by photon exchange. Even what you're hearing is intermediated by photon exchange at your eardrum, by things bouncing into it and exchanging electric fields. But certainly what you're seeing is intermediated by photon exchange, quite literally. So in this sense, the observed present universe may be seen as just a single, albeit rather complicated little point, where everything is just happening here and now, and right here in your head. And you are, each one of us, is at the absolute cutting edge of the present moment. Everyone else, all the other people talking to you, me talking to you, is in your past. Might only be if you if you're a meter away, it's three nanoseconds ago, roughly. Yeah, we're all going to be using feet soon because uh, a light nanosecond is about a foot. So, uh, and there's a move a foot, if you'll pardon the pun, to unify meters and seconds by using the speed of light, which might not be a good idea. But anyway, that's right here. Now we're going to do some hard maths, okay. Uh, or maybe not okay, but anyway, we're going to do some maths. Right. Um, you see, it, when you're doing wave function absolute relativity, you have a bit of a problem because the rules are that you have to have the proper space-time form wherever it appears, including the argument. Now that could be a problem, but it isn't because these objects, these gamma matrices, these alpha matrices here, are such that when you multiply something, so for example, here, I have e to the alpha three kz, that's like e to the i kz, because alpha three squared is minus one. So I can write that as cos kz plus alpha three sine kz, just as the same way I can write e to the i kz is cos kz plus i sine kz, because that's what exponentials do for you. They convert nasty 
falling and rising exponentials to lovely oscillating cosines and sines, as a lot of you know. Now, it's kind of a little bit less good here in this thing, because here's, a, here's, a, here's an absolute relativistic wave function, y0 times e to the alpha 3kz, fine, alpha 3 squares to minus 1, but wait a minute, time squares to plus 1. This thing is minus something which squares to plus one on your t. That's a shine or a cosh, not a sine or a cos. It ain't no traveling wave. It's a falling exponential, at least at long distances. It's not a traveling wave. However, by not complex number magic, but by the even more potent gamma matrix magic, gamma Dirac Clifford magic, if you multiply this thing by a unit spin element along the direction of motion, in other words, if you introduce a unit spin element into the equation, literally, then magically the thing changes to a four component wave function, two of which transform as mass and two of which transform as field. In other words, it looks very like an electromagnetic field with an electric field and with a massive pair, just as in quantum mechanics, just as in the Dirac equation, except here, the mass is now dynamical and not static. This represents a stationary mass field wave. It represents an element of the electron wave function. It has the remarkable property that it becomes a pure field propagating wave if you multiply by equal electric and magnetic fields. So if you take that object and then you stick something in front of it, which is a, an electromagnetic field, either multiply it either add it or subtract it, if you like, to the equation, then it turns into a photon-like state. My goodness gracious me. That is, this wave can, is that thing which can emit and absorb electromagnetic radiation. This mathematics is so beautiful. It's doing the things that nature does. It's solving Hilbert's sixth problem before your very eyes. So let's do that. Here we are on the next slide. Multiply by equal but perpendicular. This is EX BY, a photon like thing. Multiplying that thing, I'll put this factor R in. That R, factor R is, think about that factor R as just being one. So it's kind of like not there at all. That's the redshift or blue shift which you need to have because your emitter and absorber are not necessarily in the same frame. They can be moving with respect to one another. So if you choose one of them to be, well, okay, the eigenframe of the photon will be the average of those two. It'll be in the system where the two things are co-moving if they're moving towards each other or contra-moving, well, I shouldn't use co and contra, moving apart, or they could be moving sideways or at any vector, it doesn't matter. That R factor will fix that for you for the exchange photon. Because the, the emission is from point A, that's wherever it is, to point B, about wherever it's going to be. Not where it was, but where it's going to be. The emitter sends out things into the future. The absorber receives things from the past. The reason you can only see the past is because everything coming into you is from your past. The stuff you're sending out, you're radiating at 300 Kelvin right now, is going into your future. You don't know where it's going. The only thing that's going to know where it's going is when it gets absorbed by some very, very cold pirate over on Pluto, Pluto Minor, somewhere near the edge of the universe, that they will then absorb your future going stuff. Past and future are only directions. But the reason that you only see the past is because your experience is only of the past. You only see things that are coming in as, at higher energy to you and that are impinging on your senses. This is why you see the past, but the future is just as valid. It's just as relevant. Anyway, that's nothing to do with this particular wave function. This particular wave function is a magic thing that if you multiply by perpendicular in B, you get something which is a traveling wave, which is a pure light-like state. Now, I don't have time to show that at the moment because that's some pretty hairy mass, but you can do it yourself at home. It's quite fun. Or, alternatively, you can look at my 2019 paper, which is referenced in the uh, email I sent where it's done in gory detail. So this is as presented in uh, San Diego in 2016 at, uh, at, um, at um, Nature Photons What is Light conference. So um, how does 
quantization work? This is answering question B, by the way. How does, how does photon quantization work? Well, first of all, space and time have their proper form in the exponent, as they have to do. But we're also introducing a frequency, and that frequency, and we're also introducing some uh, scale factor here. So scale factor will be one in the proper frame of the photon. It's different to one in any other frame. It's quantized with a single scale parameter, but it's also multiplied by H0. Now, H0 is something which is related to Planck's constant. The quantization of the photon comes about because if I change this R, imagine I make R bigger. What happens is uh, that, so, so, so R getting bigger means that the electric fields are getting bigger and the frequency is getting bigger. This is a higher energy photon. Now it oscillates more quickly, but it becomes smaller and it has more energy because it has a bigger field. So it gets a bigger energy, but a smaller radius, bigger energy linearly, smaller radius linearly. Result, same angular momentum. This photon has the same angular momentum in any frame. It has an eigen angular momentum. And it's multiplied by a universal constant H0, which means that all photons have the same angular momentum. All emitter absorber systems have the same angular momentum. Quantized slide. For any photon, its eigen R is always unity. This is a field only solution to the free space Maxwell's equation. So if I take that and I do D of that, I will get zero. Again, a nice sum to do at home. D mu that. Very nice sum to do at home. So if you look at the wave pattern here, so if I ex expand this thing in sines and cosines, which uh, I can do because they're all, they all square to minus one, then what I find to my astonishment, well, not to my astonishment really, is that you get exactly the field pattern for a circularly polarized photon, of course. However, if I extend this thing here, not just alpha 3z minus alpha 0t, but I do alpha 3z plus alpha 2y plus alpha 2x. So I look laterally, or if I do r theta laterally, better. So alpha 3z plus alpha 2 uh, phi plus alpha 1r. Then what I find for the r component is that it falls exponentially. The thing has a falling exponential envelope on it. But not only that, every element of this, so it, Photon field distribution is such that everything is rotating about every point in space. There's a falling exponential envelope on that. The thing is laterally confined. This is a photon which is quantized, which is laterally confined along the line from the mission to absorber. So the thing looks like a photon because, as opposed to merely EM radiation, it matches the experimental properties of the physical photon. E is perpendicular to B and it's quantized. It's the solution to the linear first order Maxwell's equations, E and B, at once. Its physical propagation matches the electric and magnetic handedness. I didn't mention that. If I switch electric and magnetic field here, if I change the handedness of this, so I put minus alpha 3, 1 there, then the thing propagates in the opposite direction. Automatically, it's in the maths. So it matches the physical propagation of the electric and magnetic handedness, E cross B, gives me the direction of propagation. It scales to any energy, radio to gamma, varying by varying the single parameter R. So a thing emitted here as, uh, as, as blue can get to the edge of the universe and be absorbed as very far infrared at the edge of the universe as we see the far edge of the universe looking from where we are, of course. So if we're looking at very far away things using the uh, James Webb telescope, we're also looking at things that are desperately redshifted, which we can do because of this factor R. And the energy transferred is proportional to the frequency alone. So that begs the question of why do you get the redshift, of course, but that's for Viv in one of his talks. What about the quantization? The quantization here, the H0 isn't a property of the, of the light. Light can have any amount of energy. It's a property that's imposed on it by the fact that the electric emitter and the electric absorber are electrons. And H is quantized by electrons as a relationship between H and E, between Planck's constant and the charge, which Martin and I derived in our 1997 paper, which I'm going to do also shortly, given time. I know I've already talked for two hours, so oh, we're getting there, though. We're really getting through this. 
Now, I've talked about these wave functions. I've said these are four component wave functions. If I sit still, if I fix T and run Z, then what happens here is I'll, I'll, what, what I get is I get a rotating electric field. However, if I fix Z and let T run, uh, sorry, if I, if I fix Z and let T run, then I get a rotating uh, field. If I fix, if I look along the thing in Z, I get an alpha zero, one, two, three. I get an oscillation, which is just a, an oscillation between E and B, a uh, sine wave, cosine wave for E and a cosine wave for B. So what this represents in space is it represents a spatial modulation of E and B. And what it represents, if you sit still as you do as an absorber, is it represents a rotating thing which comes in and hits you as a rotating object, which is exactly what light does. The thing has different components for Z and T. It acts differently in Z and T as it must. And this is in complete contrast to the normal thing you have for a Ki to the Kx minus omega T, where Kx minus omega T is pure scalar. That is wrong. It's not powerful enough. It doesn't represent what actually happens with a photon. This does. Right. It has the same angular momentum in all frames. It's quantized. Matching boundary conditions gives black body quantization. So it gives the initial thing that quantization was found on. And it's limited laterally, not only by a falling exponential, but also each element by a rotation horizon. Infinite plane waves are not supported. And what it does is it underpins and it shows the why of the harmony of phases, Louis de Broglie. Now, harmony of phases, a lot of you may not have heard of this. Before quantum mechanics, before lambda is h over p, there was Louis de Broglie and he was doing a thesis. And what concerned Louis de Broglie is relativity. He was looking at relativistic quantum oscillators before relativistic quantum mechanics. And what he's worried about is he's worried about the relativistic law of scaling of clocks. As clocks move, they slow down. Tick, do, do, do. He knew they slowed down. But he also knew that as you accelerated a a quantum oscillator, the frequency went up and hence its energy went up. And what he worried about is how can it both go up and go down at the same time? How can it do both? Now, that does sound a little bit contradictory, but luckily Louis de Broglie was a genius, so he worked it out quite quickly. And it was what he said is he said, look, for a quantum oscillator, there are two oscillations going on. Those two oscillations are independent, but they are such that at all points in space, for all space and for all time, the two oscillations have the same phase. They have a phase harmony between each other. Now that is the case for this wave function. Now that may sound impossible, but it is perfectly possible. So if you look at harmony of phases, you'll find out why and how. And better, if you read French, read de Broglie's thesis, or read some of de Broglie's papers, they are so beautiful. Even if you don't read French, the French is the best French ever. It's absolutely beautiful French, right? Very much. If you, if, you, if you could do it at all, I would go for the French version. Now, what this was called when it was first proposed in uh, 1923 or so, was it was called French madness. Now, when experiments were done to have a look at it, and they found that the thing waved at the de Broglie frequency lambda is h over p, which is a necessary consequence of this, looking at these phase harmonies from a different frame, uh, it was became very quickly the basis for quantum mechanics, which was proposed very soon afterwards. But people don't teach that this thing arose from relativity. In fact, there's a whole fashion now to think there's some cause of contradiction between relativity and quantum mechanics. And people say, it's very strange. It seems to, just at the point where you think the things were going to, they seem to make sense. Well, they do make sense because that's how the thing was derived in the first place, you ignorant people. It's part of an insidious tendency to mistake maths for reality. You're not, you start with lambda is h over p instead of starting with understanding why the thing is an oscillator that both speeds up and slows down, which is a real understanding, instead of just starting with some goddamn maths. Deary me. So, what about quantization? I want to do some, I want to give some answers here. So 
what is quantization? What are we talking about here? We're talking about things which are really given by a quantum number. Quantum means countable. It means one, one two, three. You get a certain number of those things. What, what are the kinds of quantum what quantization that we have to observe? And what is their origin? Well, the most important one is space coherence, kx and omega t, space time, space, and its inverse. For quantization, any oscillation that's happening has to bite its own tail in phase. So one wavelength, two wavelengths, two half wavelengths, half a wavelength bounces back to produce a full wavelength in a quantum, in a, in a, in a quantum well. This is the first kind of quantization. Now, what about spin? Spin is a spin space phase coherence. The thing is spinning in spin space, and you have to have phase coherence in that. This doesn't necessarily match with the space space coherence, because you can have things that go around twice, as in a fermion. So you have a, a space space, and you have a spin space coherence. Then you have things like charge quantization. Now, this is a different sort of thing. Charge quantization comes from the topology of the photon path. So if you take a photon and make it go around a double loop and calculate its charge, you'll find that it's quantized, that it always comes out at about EQ, the charge of the electron, the positron. So that's one thing, but where that quantization comes from, why is it what it is? Why is it that particular number is quantized? Why is it what it is? The, the why of that is that any given electron is an interactor. So this electron at the end of my finger is interacting with the rest of the universe very rapidly all the time. So the kind of rate of this is about 10 to the 19, 10 to the 20 hertz. So it's continuously interacting with other electrons and protons around it. In fact, it's probably in a hydrogen atom just there, an H2O. And so a lot of its interaction is backwards and forwards between the proton. The proton and the electron in the hydrogen atom have the same de Broglie wavelength. They're a resonance of each other. It's an it isn't an electron and a proton. It's an electroproton. And it's electroproton that has sunk down and has lost some of its mass, 13.6 electron volts, to form a hydrogen atom. Wonderful. It's a wonderful thing. It's a different kind of particle to an electron or a proton, a hydrogen atom. But that, so what's happening is that interaction is taking place there, but it's also taking place with the rest of the universe. And the fine structure constant gives you the rate at which that happens compared to the base rate of oscillation of the system. And that's actually, a, there's a square in there as well, but that's where the one over 137.136 comes from. That's where the fine structure constant comes from. It comes from the probability is about one, one bit less than 1% that this object emits a photon and that object absorbs it. Now that probability is only quantum, that's quantum electrodynamics. That's all quantum electrodynamics is. It's that one over 137. And the only other thing you do is you make it geometric. So if it's twice as far away, the probability goes down by a factor of, of four, not two. And that's it. It's just geometry and probability. And that is quantum electrodynamics. And the fine structure constant comes about because that only takes place one over one, three, seven of the time, pretty much, that it finds a match between charge one and charge two. So it goes as, it goes as charge squared, because there are two charges in the middle. So look at quantum electronics, look at the structure of the mathematics. That's what it does. So where charge quantization comes from, in my view, is all the electrons in my finger are interacting with the same universe. They all have the same probability of finding a match. They therefore all have the same charge. All the protons have the same probability of finding a match. And you need to have an individual match between emitter and absorber every time, although it can be an array of emitters and absorbers as well, of course, as we know. But it needs to be local. So you have to have a local thing where that locality is ensured because the emitted photon brings them together. Same point in space-time. Charge quantization is then stochastic. It means that individual charges will fluctuate a little bit, but not much because it's a very high rate. Could be measured, good test. Flux quantization is a magnetic field space coherence. So we've got a spin space coherence, magnetic field space coherence. The electric field space coherence is with the whole universe because the electric field is huge. The magnetic field falls off very quickly. Spin space, spin field even more quickly. Spin field is limited by rotation horizon. Magnetic field goes as inverse cube, electric field inverse square to the edge of the universe. So that means that subsequent shells have the same probability of interactions as, uh, as, as, as each other because there's a squared number of extra mass or extra, extra, extra charge in them. So there are lots more in precise modes. For example, in the lepton number, the lepton number is a, is a, is a configuration 
a harmonic coherent configuration that is conserved over certain kinds of interactions. And there are a whole set of these things, but they can all be understood in terms of these kinds of quantization. You need, con but to have a single coherent resonant object, you need all of the coherences to happen. These coherences are, are really extra constraints on whether or not something can exist or not. For something to exist, it has to be able to self-recreate itself continuously. Otherwise, it's not there. Well, and these things are related in sets, sets as we're discussing at the moment. Right, there we are. Okay, well, what, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to run through the electron. How do you turn light into matter? So how do you braid light into matter? Well, the way you do this is you take a photon, which is, has this twist. So I'll just use the belt trick for that. So we take a photon, put a single turn into the photon. And, and, and so the belt, when we represent the belt as having the electric field coming out towards you and the shiny side of the belt, and the magnetic field coming out E, e towards me, E cross B means the things traveling in this direction. And I'm going to put a twist in it to represent one wavelength. So a whole turn, and then take the belt and uh, Throw this, well, not it, so it bites its own tail to one wavelength, and you get this object. So, and this object is the one denoted in the. So, what's happened is the twist is still in the belt, there's the twist, but because of the configuration, because of the configuration of this thing, it forms a double loop, not a single loop. And also, what the electric field is doing is it's now always outward directed, so this object becomes charged, and the thing has a magnetic field which is pointing over this way. The thing has a magnetic moment. It has a it has an inducible magnetic moment. What the object does is it's still twisting in the frame of the belt, but that twist is commensurate with the double loop of going around. So the belt is no longer twisted. It's got a twist and an equal and opposite untwist coming from the fact that it's going around in a loop. And then what the whole thing does to make it spherically symmetric is it rotates. It tumbles. Tumbles at frequency one. It rotates at frequency two, and it twists at frequency one. So it's a one-to-one one, um, modulation, the simplest possible one is an electron or a positron. So there we are, and what that does is that gives us this loop we talked about before. And then this is the central side of the tool. This is the process of electron-positron creation or annihilation explained in detail. What happens is two... In electron positron annihilation, this is the double loop electron. This is a double loop positron. Electric field outward, electric field inward. Two things come together. They are oppositely rotating. They untwist into two photons, one going out, this one going out, and this one coming in. In fact, this shows positron, the reverse process, electron positron creation. Two photons coming in, both with the same polarization, both right or both left interact with one another in a twisted mode. So what's happening is they come in, the electric and magnetic fields are operating like this. And it means the, ele the net electric and magnetic fields are parallel, not perpendicular in the region of overlap. What that does is that takes the pointing vector to zero and it stops light. That stopped light state is a proto-electron-positron pair. They then roll up into and what is also created there is field cancellation. Now, field cancellation gives you mass. If you stop light, you have mass. You have mass being created. Once you've created enough mass, so that you have an equal amount of mass to the energy in the electromagnetic field, then what happens is that starts to curl the photons. Why does it curl the photons? Because if you look at the original equations, you'll see, wait a minute, let's get back to the equations. Ding, 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 ding. Uh, not that one, that one. If you look at the equations, what happens is that the, um, the force is a rate. So what, what you had before is you had a divergence of E, but you have an exchange with the rest of the universe of scalar energy. So you have a charge that arises in this, in this thing just here. But also, if you have a look at the forces and what the forces are, I haven't done the forces yet. I need to do the forces. I'll get onto the forces later, maybe. But what happens with, at the level of the forces Perhaps not have time for that. That might be another talk. What happens at the level of the forces is you find that, well, if you look at the level of the pointing vector, what you find is the pointing vector is E cross B. 
But if you put the pivot in there, you have E cross, you have E times B plus P. And EP is perpendicular, is a momentum which is perpendicular to E cross B. What happens is that starts to curl the photons. If you have enough mass, they curl and bite their own tails, and you produce an electron positron pair. They're probably about 1 over 137. The raw probability is that. So what you start with is you start with an element of electron wave function, photon wave function here. So you either go from this to that or from that to this, production or annihilation of charges or emission of photons, where the energy is given by h bar omega cm. So these are the equations governing that. We've talked about those. Those are the equations I had before. So that is the process by which electron positron pairs are created. And they're only ever created in pairs. You can't create just electrons or just positrons because you need to conserve all the conserved quantities, energy, momentum, charge, spin, et cetera, et cetera, lepton number, et cetera. So there are, that's the process of electron positron pair creation in the model. Not, I should say, to the same scale. The electron loop here is about a 12th, uh, is about lambda c over 12, whereas here, this is lambda c. So these things are really showing about 10 times the size they should be, just for clarity. Okay, so that's the process of electron positron pair creation. These are the wave functions, electron and uh, photon. Right. So this looks like a, a donut we have here, but Electrons are not donuts. And in fact, the motion is not a little electron running around a donut, as, as I have misrepresented as saying on many occasions. <laughs> the reason is that the electron has nothing to rotate about but itself. So if I project this onto normal space, this is the, this toroidal thing here, these smoke rings are meant to represent the sphere around which the electron is rotating. This, these are meant to, these smoke rings here are meant to represent the pivot. But the point is they all represent the same pivot. So I should really imagine this as a little ball of mass energy around which the whole thing is rotating. And I have to imagine, so I have to imagine instead of taking this thing and going around and around the loop, I have to imagine the loop going round and round the ball of pivot. And then I end up with something which looks like the center thing here. So the projection onto normal space of this field momentum space toroidal configuration is simply spherical. And the reason that these things are is they're really both projections of a hypersphere and the projections of a hypersphere are tori in spheres. So that, in fact, it's not even a hypersphere, it's worse than, a, it's several hyperspheres. It's worse than a hypersphere. It's a six component object field, well, it's a nine component object field momentum space. So we're talking about a projection from 9D down to 3D. So the outer diagram here is the toroidal thing in field momentum space. And the inner diagram is the projection onto normal space, spherical motion onto normal space. One ends up with a spherically sym symmetric point-like, very small charged particle with a fermionic double loop symmetry. Now, why is it point-like? Well, well, I wasn't going to do this, but I think I'll do this. I've actually got a slide here somewhere right at the bottom. There we are. The reason, slide 71, the reason that it's point-like is because th this is a representation of the electron going around and around in the loop. If I have two electrons merging, they're going to hit one another. They're actually light speed rotations. So what happens is the, this is going around and around like this. This one's going around and around like this. That's coming towards each other at light speed, but then they're going away from each other at light speed. And despite the fact they're converging, half the time they're going away from each other at light speed. So if you imagine particle in a box thing that I had before, the bit that's converging is blue shifted, the bit that's diverging is red shifted. That's what's shown here, this thing's moving. And in fact, the bits that hit one another there is only the blue shifted part. And the blue shifted part gets smaller. And the harder I try and bash the things together, the smaller it gets, it transforms like a photon. So, if you, if, you, if you measure anything at any energies above the electron mass, the thing's gonna transform like a photon. And no matter how hard you bash them together, it'll still look like something smaller by a factor of six or so, because the size of this region is 10 to the minus, just a minute, I might have to stop for a while, is, is, uh, is uh, 10 to the minus six of the, size of the wavelength of, each, of the maximal exchange wavelength of the photon. And, uh, and and so um, 
and so the thing scales just like uh, just like light. So, um, so I'll make sure all the slides are up there so people can look at them. But we'll go we'll go to answering the questions. All right. So so here is white can be both droid and spherical, basically because they're both projections of a hypersphere. Here are three different um, views of the thing as it tumbles, three views of the same field. Can everybody see that? Yeah. Yeah, we, we are actually sharing, okay. So, actually the quantum spin is very interesting, and this is one that I personally really enjoyed doing. The thing is, if you're looking at quantum spin, you do, you, you're looking at the projection onto a measure, piece of measuring equipment. So what it does is it hunts through all the bivectors within a half cycle, and in the order of 0 0.01 attoseconds, there's a match. And it's only when you get a match that you get transfer, because only at that point do you get a resonant harmonic coherence. So this is, this is why the spin's always in the same direction. You always get, it's like trying to catch, what you're doing is you, you've got a, a rotating, rotating, rotating thing, and you're trying to fix it by sticking an axis into it. And what it does, it goes, and it wraps around. So if it's doing that multiple rotation, so if you imagine a multiple rotation, you try and stick a stick through the quantum bicycle spokes, it will simply resolve onto your measuring apparatus all of its spin one way or the other. So depending on where you stick it, it'll either be left spinning or right spinning around your quantum stick. So that's how spin works. And you get the whole thing. And you always only get half H bar or plus H bar because of the uh, way that angular momentum works in the quantum bicycle. So if you take the quantum bicycle thing here, this thing, and you integrate over all the spin states, you've got these different spins, but all, most of the spins cancel because for everything that's going one way, by the time it tumbles over, it's going the other way. So it's spinning the other way. The only thing that's left is the spin around the, um, is, is, the is the only thing that's left is this one, the one around the eye of the torus. That's the only one that doesn't integrate to zero. And that's always a half H bar. So that's pretty cool. So that's absolutely beautiful. Plus or minus a half H bar. Right, okay, where were we? Okay, so what about quarks? What are quarks? Well, uh, people think they're little hard things inside the inside the uh, inside the, the nucleon, but they're not, because when I looked at these things in during my thesis time at CERN back in the 1980s, the harder we looked, the less quark-like they were. So we started and we saw quarks that roughly taking about a sixth of the angular moment, of the momentum of the uh, proton. But at much higher energies, they were taking a 60th or a 600th or a 6,000th. The more you looked, the less they were there at all. But I think the quark geometry really exists, but it isn't really a little hard blob within, you know, with quantum properties within. The quantum numbers that are given to quarks, remember that a quantum number is an expression of everything you don't understand. I think what really happens is you have something which is almost a double loop, but not quite. And then you have three of them. So if you imagine that, this is like a double loop. It's gone round twice and it's come out and it's had the effect of changing something going in minus X plus Y. And I can fit another one which goes around the other way, goes around backwards, goes around in the opposite direction. And if I call that an anti-quark, call, call a left-handed one a quark and a right-handed one an anti-quark, then a quark-anti-quark -quark pair makes a continuous loop. And that's an allowed particle. So QQ bars are allowed if you identify a quark with being a geometry that transforms an internal photon going in one direction to one going in a perpendicular direction. It doesn't matter which perpendicular direction, and it's only total transformations that matter, because if you imagine having a two-thirds transformation, you need uh, a three-quarters transformation is what you need. But if you you have to add a bunch of them around because you still have to stick them together like Lego somehow, so you have to get to a, a three quarters transformation. So there's only one other way to stick things like this, which transform x to y and get something three dimensional. That's to go x y y z z x. If you want to do the same handedness, you need three. So the fact you need three of the same handedness and you make one an opposite one is not a surprise. I think quarks are geometrical, they're not physical objects. And then you get all of the quark symmetries, you get the reason why you only have QQQ and QQ bar, you get all of the symmetry without any nonsense about quarks, which pretty much don't exist at all if you try and look for them. Quantum chronodynamics is a terrible theory. It's, 
it's really a terrible theory. Don't, uh, I don't want to talk about that too much. I'll stop now or I'll get rude. Right, what about other particles, atoms and coherent crystals? Well, the new paradigm allows thinking about things that you otherwise couldn't think about at all. So the generations I talked about last time, the, the reason for the generations is that if you've looped something from a photon, which is going linearly, and you twist it around so it bites its own tail, so you end up with something like this, then that thing itself, if it's moving, again, looks like a rotating object. What I can do with that is I can make it bite its own tail again. I can do a rotation of a rotation. So if the single loop, if I have a single loop like this, it kind of goes up, along, down, and along. It's like a box. So if I look in one dimension of that, I've got it going up and I've got it coming down. I've got a pair of, of and, I, and I make, so in 3D, I have a piece of space which is bounded by edges. Now that piece of space is, at least part of the time, unavailable because a photon, it's an interactor. So one over one three seventh of the time, it takes that piece of space out. So it, so it, so it, it hits, it, it will interact with things. Now, what happens if I twist it again? Instead of having two things, I have four. Now I have four possible edges. To, I have four possible, I have four in X, I have four in Y, I have four in Z, making, you might think, four times four times four boxes, but no, because if I look at the four, I can make a box from this pair, this pair, this pair, this pair, uh, this pair. I can make six objects two the, the there are six twos in four objects so if i look at that then that means that the number of boxes taken out is six cubed for something that goes around twice and if i looked at six of these objects so if i look at six of these objects then the number of possible boxes becomes 15 there are there are 15 ways of making two out of six so i should expect to see things which are exactly the same as the electron, still bound states of the photon, massive bound states of the photon, but at six cubed times the mass and 15 cubed times the mass. And guess what the mass of the muon is with respect to the electron and the mass of the, of the tauon is with respect to the, uh, with respect to the electron. They're, very, they're within a few percent, both of them. So um, I think it's at least plausible that these, given the quark model, I've just, um, that, that um, this is the reason that we have generations. So the generations are simply tied to loops. And you might say, what's the next one? Well, the next one doesn't exist because what you're doing is you're going from, from a 4D thing to a 3D thing, then you're going to a 2D, uh, then you go to a 2D thing, and then you don't have any dimensions left in, in, to vibrate in. So you, don't, you can only wind it, wi wind it up in one dimension, then wind it up in two dimensions, then wind up in three dimensions, and you run out of dimensions to wind it up in. So there isn't anything beyond the third. That's also a prediction of the theory. There are no higher generations than three. So that's the reason for the muon and the tauon. Quarks are three quarter turn loops. And what it would mean is it means the proton should be the order of the tauon mass, but a bit lighter because the proton takes out three elements that it would need to have otherwise. So it takes out three of the boxes. So it should be about half the mass. But it's, that's the lightest three vortex system. Uh, the light mesons, they go around twice as well. They go around a figure of eight. So it should be about the same mass as the, as, as the muon, and they are. So there is some sense in this, but really it's conjecture, I think, uh, and not really uh, at the same level as the theory I've just been talking about. So I think that's what other particles are. So this is kind of answering questions five, seven, eight, and A of the questions that we had before. Let's see what else gives some actual answers. Talk about crystals. Well, I'll just leave this up for a second. I'm not gonna talk about crystals or something. I'll leave that to Arnie in a later talk. This is the same sort of diagram of flows that I showed before, uh, but done in a different way. And I think I won't talk to that or this. Oh. Yes, I won't talk to the side. There are analogies. You, you can think of the pivot and the quadrivector as being sort of pivotal bookends to this thing of time, frequency, and energy as being a linear, sort of linear deformation of space time, of this being a sort of torsion of space time, and this being a twist, space time twist, the momentum. 
this being um, a tide vortex and this being a four dimensional hedgehog. Yeah, I mean, don't take these things too seriously, it doesn't. Okay, I want to explain, no, I didn't. I was gonna explain how the exclusion principle worked and what it was and why it was. Uh, but the main reason the exclusion principle, exclusion principle isn't a principle, it's a very strong force. It's a stronger force than the strong force. If you look at um, uh, O'Fallon et al, Fisrev 1977, they had a look using the zero gradient synchrotron at the Argonne National Laboratory. And what they found is, to their astonishment, is that the exclusion principle dominated over the strong interaction by a factor of four at the, at the, the, at the highest energies. So there's a very accessible article in uh, Scientific American 1979 when the leader of the group, um, Alan Krish, gives a very, very good exposition as to why the quark model is invalid, to Bene. And certainly principle, well, things zittering around like this, it's obvious that the thing's gonna be uncertain by a factor of about lambda C over four pi, which it is. So Hestney's already um, had published a paper in 1980 while I was still at university on this, sort of a vague interpretation of quantum mechanics, I think is completely correct. Quantum collapse, I was gonna talk about, but I won't because it's not one of the questions. Standard theory. Yes, okay, leave that too. Generations, generation. Yes, okay, we've done that. If you wanna look for where the quantum spin is, then the best place to look is an extremal pass because you're doing an integrate, you're doing an integral. It's where the integral reaches an edge. Most of the spin, half of the spin, integral is in the twist through the hole in the torus when you make the torus very big. So this is an extremal path with a glass torus going through, and then without the glass torus, just showing how the thing looks as you twist it. And, um, and you see that really it's not twisting, not twisting, not twisting, and then bling, it twists through the torus. So, um, and that's the half integral H bar pretty much there in the eye of the torus at the extremal paths. Okay, how do you get the charge? Well, um, this is an important one. So this is one for indeed what the electron charge is. It's coming from the spin. So what you have is you have H bar of H, H bar omega of energy in the photon. So you know how big the loop is. The double loop is lambda C over, over four pi. And you know what the field is. It's half electric field, half magnetic field, or, or of that order anyway. So you take that electric field, you put it down to that length scale, you put a sphere around that and you calculate what the flux is through the surface. And what you find to your actual astonishment is that if the two loops lie on top of one another, you get 0.9e. And as you begin to open up the torus so it gets bigger, it goes through exactly e and it goes up to when you get to the twisty torus thing that I just showed. When you get through this, it goes to about 15e. So, so it spans the electron charge. It comes, so when, so doing an estimate of that, for the tightest double loop, you get one over two pi root three epsilon zero h bar c. This calculation is done in the 97 paper, which is about 0.91 e. If you go looser, it gives a charge up to more than 10 electron charges. What about the spin? Well, the spin is exact. The spin reduces down to just the stuff around the eye of the torus, which is h bar over two. All, all the other contributions integrate to zero. One thing that's very important about this model is that it gives the anomalous magnetic moment of the electron that arises from the rotation horizon. Again, going to this path just here, the rotation horizon is when you stretch this thing as far as it will go, and that gives, gives you roughly lambda C over two. Everything outside that cannot rotate because it's at the frequency of oscillation of the electron, it can't get round quick enough. This is a single wavelength, but anything, anything longer than that or bigger than that is gonna hit a rotation horizon. It's not going to be able to rotate. And that gives you an anomalous magnetic moment of one plus alpha over two pi, which is the QED correction, the first order QED correction to the anomalous magnetic moment, which this model predicts. We don't do, there's, there's a lot of stuff on, on inversion. This is where I go into the mathematics of inversion. The most important thing for this is one can find a general formula for the inversion. This is a van der Mark equation. This is in the 2021 paper that I have included. I won't go into that because it's just too much detail. Charge quantization comes from exchange, as I mentioned. That's question E. Another question is how the electron manages to be so big and yet so small in different 
So particle physicists thinks it's smaller than 10 to the minus 18 meters. Classical field theories thinks, thinks that it's bigger than the uh, electron um, charge radius, which is bigger than femtometers. Solid state person thinks that electrons are hundreds of nanometers in size. I talked about that Manfred as well. So you can look at one of my papers in PRB if you want on that, where I measured the electron size in the solid state to be about 40 nanometers. So, so that charge is spread over 40 nanometers in a wave form that you can make one half wavelength to just the quantum mechanical shapes, the charge gets spread. So, so it comes, comes through gradually, not as a lump, it doesn't appear all at once. So, but if you're a superconducting energy engineer, the electrons in that are all as big as your piece of, twice the size of your piece of superconductor. So, so the new maglev line from London to Tokyo would be twice as big as that, bigger than the planet. So the question is, who's right about the size of the electron? And everybody is, but how does that work? And the way that it works is that that shrinkage when you look down to very small sizes is um, the way that it gets very small compared to the 10 to minus 13 meters, which it is where Compton size. The way that it gets very large is, is as you put an electron, for example, if you drop an electron, actually, the way that it gets very large is what Arnie's gonna talk about in a subsequent talk at some stage. I think I better leave it at that. But what's basically happening is if you go into the electric, if you go into the, into the hydrogen atom, what's happened is that both the proton and the electron blow up. Why do they blow up? They blow up because they are superimposed on top of one another. They're canceling each other's charge. The total charge in a hydrogen atom is exactly zero. And the wavelength over which that takes place is, is about an angstrom. So the whole charge part of the energy has been canceled. The internal charge part has been canceled. And they're much, much lower energy. We're talking about 30.6 electron volts instead of Instead of uh, 511 and, uh, and, uh, and 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 Jev, you know, so the electro proton is a very different thing to the electron and the proton. And then, as you go into the solid state, the electron gets bigger and bigger, and the electrons become macroscopic. You can see them, you can detect them, you can measure their quantum profile. So quantum mechanics is real; it's not just imaginary. So, end of talk. My goodness, only three hours. Well, two and three quarter hours. Answers to the questions in the preamble in the context of the new theory. The electric charge is quantized because all interactors are in local equilibrium. So all local charges have the same value because they're all interacting in the same medium. The Coulomb interaction comes from the rectification of the photon field and can be calculated from the spin. One can express charge in terms of H or H in terms of charge. The infinity is avoided because there exists a small scale cutoff of lambda c over four pi and a limit to the rotation horizon, which means one can do integrals of fields which simply don't diverge. It was pointed out by Dirac in the third edition, for example, of his book that lambda c over four pi was, if one could invent a reason for it being that size, would give a quantum electrodynamics, which made sense. So Dirac developed quantum electrodynamics at that stage, but he was never happy with finding the product quantum electrodynamics, and neither was Feynman, to be fair. So this is a better start to thing. You've got the charge, so you know what the charge is. I haven't talked about the mass yet. Did we ask, was the mass a question? It wasn't a question. You guys have to ask more questions. I can do the mass too, don't worry. Later. The spin is a consequence of the twist of the internal photon going round twice. The magnetic dipole is a consequence of the 1D alignment of the magnetic field, then only tumbling. So it's so what it does, it tumbles like this to be zero. So electron has zero, an isolated electron has zero magnetic dipole, but in an external field, it processes around that. So it, be, it vibrates around it as it's rotating. It has an internal spin and it processes around the direction, just generating E as mu B. Uh, the, the, it, it, the dipole moment is mu times uh, times v times the, times the magnetic field. It's induced by a magnetic field. Um, the angular momentum is a consequence of the main quantization condition. And the Zitterbewegung clock of electron is bleeding obvious in this in, in this thing. It's, it was De Broglie all along. De Broglie was right, and it's the Zitterbewegung interpretation of quantum mechanics. See 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 Hesnes's paper or Martin's talk at San Diego. Uh, so Martin gave a paper at uh, San Diego 2016 
which is on the uh, Quicicle website if anyone wants to download it. It's called um, Heavy Beatbox. Is the yes has heavy beatbox in the title anyway. On the rest of the title. Now we have three leptons because there are four dimensions into which stuff to stuff dynamics. And if you fold it and fold it and fold it again, that's so much folding as you can do, and that generates the high masses. Uh, what was questions? Oh, I didn't do question six here. What are well baryons are made from quarks, QQQ, mesons, quark, anti-quark, in the figure of eight things. Strangeness is the analogon of the as the electron is to the muon, the up quark is to the strange quark. Uh, so that's where strangeness comes from. Neutrino, I think the neutrino is a two-dimensional particle. The photon is a one-dimensional particle. The electron is a 3D particle. I think that um, I think the neutrino is a two-dimensional particle, and very nearly massless, but not quite. The proton's lighter because the neutron is the mixed state of the electroproton that incorporates the neutrino. And this is something which um, both Viv and possibly Arnie as well will talk about in future talks from the Quisical group. So, but it's it's lighter because well, the neutron's really an electron plus a proton plus plus a neutrino plus an extra rotation which is happening in there to allow the electro proton to um, become a, a, a three component object. What you're doing is you're stuffing. An electron which is already a double loop into a proton which is three nearly double loops and then you're making them go around this thing together so you're, you're stuffing extra mass in there um, an extra loop into that whole thing an extra and that is going to increase the mass but then the mass is going to come down because of sharing and the fact that they're so close is probably what's a bit stranger but it certainly should be heavier than the proton but what holds nuclei against the coulomb force well what it, it spin forces uh, for, for, for myself and Arnie, but, but Viv is going to talk a lot about what holds nuclei together against the Coulomb force. So I'll leave the, I'll leave the thunder for Viv there. And uh, I think Viv's view of what's happening there is probably more convincing than my own view of it. So I think I'll leave Viv to talk about that. Viv, Viv Robinson will be talking about some of that at some point. How to get gravity? Well, Again, Viv has a model for that. I have a different model. For me, uh, the way that gravity works is if you've got is it shadow force of electromagnetism. How does that work? Well, the thing is that you've got a, a universe which is full of particle-particle interactions. If you put a third particle in between there, which absorbs a potential photon which could interact with another photon, it kind of shadows that other particle. And that shadow force is always positive if you work it out. It's like a piece of space time is missing on the interaction. And it's also inverse square if you work it out. And then if you put the, if in, in the quantum electrodynamics calculation, instead of putting all possible modes in, you put possible modes between existing particles in, and the number comes out of the right magnitude. So Martin and I, well, Martin mostly, did a calculation about that some years ago. And we developed the model a little bit. We decided it wasn't particularly convincing. So uh, or we couldn't really convince ourselves, so we kind of gave up on that. Viv does better. So, um, why does it behave quantum mechanically, not classically? Not a good question. It does both, obviously. It's quantum mechanical and is it a pervading part of it? It's classical as the motion of the whole thing. What's its energy distribution? Uh, sorry, what are we talking about? Photon. Photon. Fo well, the photon I've given a wave function for is quantized light. What prevents its dissipation is it's really only at one point in space time. There is nowhere for it to dissipate. It's a pure quantum state of fixed ang ang anger momentum, angular momentum. My goodness, that must be a spell character. What's its energy distribution? Well, it's falling exponential lateral, la laterally and it's a wave longitudinally. Through all space longitudinally and compressed laterally exponentially. Bookended by emitter and absorber. Right. That was the talk thank you everybody very much for your long attention well done that's a bit of a marathon i think that's the longest talk i've ever given in my life so but i could talk much longer i've got more slides down here look so look uh there's all there's all these to go if you want but these are these are just extra slides there we are